Typically, when you go through something so traumatic and horrifying, your mind has a way to block those events to keep you from further suffering. However, I remember the events as if it was yesterday. It was a brisk October day with orange and brown leaves littering the streets and sidewalks. The temperature was a perfect chill to where you could almost see your breath. I would be going on a scout trip with my troop and some friends from school who weren't scouts but still wanted to come on the trip despite making fun of me for being on the Boy Scouts. The trip was a 10 mile hike round trip, two nights and three days. This took place back in the early 90s before the internet was on everyone's cell phone and technology took over our lives. Don't get me wrong, I enjoy the modern conveniences that technology provides, but it also took away some personal feeling from the world. Mr. Dawson was our scoutmaster. He was an old man that looked jolly but was anything but. He wore suspenders since most belts were not able to accommodate his spare tire. He had a grizzly white beard that had streaks of gray in it, and almost always wore an Indiana Jones styled hat. He was a tough man and rather strong for both his age and appearance. Despite him being an old miser to just about anyone, he did love scouting and raising boys and turning them into men. Alongside Mr. Dawson, we had an assistant scoutmaster who was more understanding when it came to the youth. Mr. Carlson was a younger man in his late 30s who wore big old glasses and always tucked his shirt in, no matter what type of pants he was wearing. I think Mr. Carlson was an accountant of some kind, but he was always a party. We all loved him. Thankfully, having both leaders made our troop very well-rounded, with both growing experiences and also fun ones. Mr. Dawson was retired and divorced. I think he had one or maybe two children, but he never spoke of them. As unfortunate as that was, he almost always came on all the scout trips, while Mr. Carlson could only come on some of them. Mr. Carlson and his wife were members of my church, and they recently had a child. This would require Mr. Carlson to sometimes stay back and help with the baby. On this trip, however, Mr. Carlson would miss the first night but hike up on the second day and meet up with us. Apparently, Mr. Dawson had an old friend that had a cabin somewhere, and he allowed the troop to stay there for a couple of nights. The troop, as well as myself and my school friends, were very excited. We have never been on a hike this long before. Normally, if we were lucky and none of the parents volunteered to come, Mr. Dawson would let us shoot his 9mm pistol that he would carry on his suspenders while camping. He also carried a double barrel shotgun in the back window of his truck, but he never let us shoot it. We all met at the parking lot after school down at the local grocery store where Mr. Dawson's old green truck sat idling. He sat inside smoking cigarettes. He was a smoker but never smoked near us. The troop trickled in over the next 15 minutes, including Mr. Carlson and his old Honda minivan. He only came for this night since we needed the extra seeds to drive all the scouts up to the campgrounds. Once all the scouts arrived, we loaded all of our bags into Mr. Dawson's truck bed and divided the scouts into both vehicles. My friends and I preferred riding with Mr. Carlson. The younger scouts, as well as some of the outcasts, were subjected to Mr. Dawson's truck where he only listened to political talk radio and talked about old war stories that were not very interesting. We caravaned both vehicles loaded to the brim with both scouts and materials to the local campgrounds on the outskirts of town. We were kind of in a hurry since we were in a race against time to get to the cabin before the darkness fell, but we had plenty of daylight if things went to plan, which in scouting, they never do. Mr. Carlson dropped us off with some of our stuff and told us that he'd be up there the next day with some peach cobbler. His peach cobbler was a hit with everyone and brought even a smile to the old grumpy Mr. Dawson. We set off to the cabin in which Mr. Dawson instructed that the two oldest scouts to guide us there using an old map and a compass. Mr. Dawson led up the rear to make sure that none of the scouts didn't venture off the path or fall behind. The thing about Mr. Dawson is that he knew the way to the cabin. 
He'd been there multiple times, in fact, but he wanted to give the scouts an opportunity to earn the orientation merit badge. For him to do that, he was not going to interfere unless it was getting too late or someone was hurt. Unfortunately, we had plenty of time before the sun was going to set, and the two scouts leading us were not geographically inclined. The two scouts began leading us, and the rest did not contribute anything constructive in terms of directions, but we did liven the spirits with talks of sports and jokes. Mr. Dawson remained quiet. The path at first was clearly laid out and had signs for the first bit, but the further we went into the dense forest, the more things began to blend in. We finally came to a fork in the path. There was no sign signaling which way was north, which is where the cabin was. The two scouts tried using the compass, but both paths seemed to be going either northwest or northeast. After two minutes of exchanging the map between the two scouts, one of them spoke up and asked Mr. Dawson for a hint. He shrugged and chuckled. I'm not the one getting the mare badge. If you want it, you gotta get us to the cabin before it gets dark he said in his old southern accent. The scouts ahead of us eventually picked the path to the right. We continued hiking, but this time we were less sure of where we were going. Our packs began to feel heavy, and despite the cool air, I for one was beginning to sweat. It was around this time that the noise in the forest began to have a strange eeriness to it. The birds that were still out this time of year didn't seem to favor this part of the forest. My anxiety was climbing, more so from being lost rather than the change in environment that we were now entering. The path began to take a significant incline as we ventured further in. It was at this moment that we all began to hear a very strange sound. It was distant but familiar. My mind immediately jumped to the worst case scenario. It sounded like someone crying out in the woods. The scouts and even the leader began to slow down as we didn't know what to do. The closer we got, the more we realized that this crying was coming off the path and into the woods. We could see not too far off that there was an old decaying cabin that seemed to be the source of the noise. Normally, most people would ignore this and continue on. Too many red flags. However, this was different. We were Boy Scouts, and we were supposed to help people. The cabin was the biggest concern. If it looked normal, then we would have left, but since it looked abandoned, then we had to make sure that there wasn't someone in trouble. At this point, Mr. Dawson got involved. I'm going to take four scouts, and we're going to go investigate. The rest of you scouts stay here so we don't lose the path. We all agreed, and he picked me and three other scouts to come with him. The cabin was covered in moss, and the wood looked old and twisted. The frame itself was slanted and looked unsafe to enter. The sound was more clear, and it sounded like an infant crying. Mr. Dawson did something that I'd never seen him do before. He unholstered his pistol and walked around the cabin perimeter, calling out to anyone inside. No one answered, and the crying continued. He went into the cabin, and we followed. It didn't take us long to find the source of the noise, and to our shock, we realized that it was coming from an old radio that wasn't plugged in. One of the scouts turned off the radio and asked, How is this possible? Mr. Dawson looked around with a look of attentiveness. We need to leave, he said. Right then the radio came on again, but this time it wasn't the crying sound. It played this eerie tune that I'd never heard before. The sound was unlike the crying and was distorted and warped, much like the rest of the cabin. We tried turning it off, but we had no luck, so we just left. When we got back to the trail, we were questioned by the other scouts and asked what was going on if there was a baby down there. We told them that it was just this old creepy radio that we couldn't turn off. As creepy as it was, none of us really paid it any mind, especially since the one camping trip where an old woman was tweaking on drugs out in the woods and we had to get the police involved. That creepy music kept playing and Mr. Dawson took us back down to the fork in the path and led us up the correct way to the cabin. The hike took a bit longer than we anticipated, but thankfully, the cabin was prepped for all of us, so all we had to do was unload our stuff and gather some firewood to start the dinner. The cabin was equipped with a fireplace stove, so we didn't have to build a fire circle and cook outside. 
This made us feel a false sense of security, especially after the incredibly odd situation that we had just encountered on the trail. It didn't take us long to gather all the firewood that we could possibly need for the trip, since there was a good number of us and we were all hungry. As we were gathering the firewood, the sun slowly began to creep behind the horizon, abandoning us to what horrors the night had to offer. We brought the firewood to the cabin, leaving most of it outside since it would have made a mess. Mr. Dawson was quick in starting the stove, and we were cooking in no time. The stove acted as a heat source for the cabin, which was nice, since the early autumn coolness was beginning to be more chilling in the evening. It took all of us a couple of minutes to be able to cook all of our food. Due to the sheer amount of scouts and the limited size of the wood-burning stove, we made makeshift seats around the stove and we enjoyed our meals as they came off the stove, one by one. As we were eating, we naturally began talking. We talked about events in our lives, school, sports, Bigfoot, whatever 12-year-olds talk about at that age. I can't remember who brought up the old radio. The atmosphere in the cabin went from a playful bliss to a more sobering, dreadful result. It wasn't so much the topic itself, but rather the theories surrounding the event. Why would a radio station be playing crying sounds? One of the scouts asked. I don't know of any station that just plays bizarre sounds. How was the radio even playing? It wasn't connected to a power source and I didn't see it have batteries, another scout mentioned. Mr. Dawson, while cooking up his meal, mentioned that he had heard of things like this before, as a war tactic. Play a sound of someone in help, whether a comrade or a helpless child, and draw in the enemy, into an unsafe area to ambush them. That explains why he walked around the old cabin with his gun out. We slowly shifted talking about theories of what could have been trapping us, to scary stories. This was way before Creepasta Wiki or horror channels on YouTube. The stories that we were sharing were either first-hand accounts of ghosts, or cryptids out in the woods, or abandoned buildings. We all took turns having the spotlight of telling scary stories when Mr. Dawson shared with us a truly terrifying story. It was when he was younger and helping his uncle move cattle across the open plains. He said it took them about a week or so to move all the cattle from one town to the other, where they would sell them in bulk. His job was to take a head count every night to keep track if they lost any cattle that day. If they lost any, then his uncle would go back and backtrack and try to find them during the night. All the cattle were equipped with very loud bells, which made finding them quite easy, but sleeping near them very difficult. On the first couple of days of the cattle drive, the company began to notice that at night, something would be disturbing the cattle into a small frenzy causing everyone to be woken up by the commotion. After a quick investigation, they would find that one of the cows had been attacked by something with large claws and was still bleeding. The wound was so severe that the cow was bound to die, either from infection or blood loss, so they ended up putting it down. Mr. Dawson explained that he had never seen a wound like that before. His only thought was that it must have been a bear of some kind, but he had never seen or even heard of bears being in that area. He then explained that he found himself having a hard time trying to sleep outside since he was exposed to whatever had injured that cow for the rest of the week. He had his theories on what he thought it could have been, but he wasn't for sure. The scout's eyes were wide and full of fear as the dim fire of the wood-burning stove began to slowly get lower. An unsettling silence fell on the group as they all considered the wide varieties of monsters and beasts that still could roam the open dark places of the world. Mr. Dawson then let out a shout to get the scouts to scream. The screams were shortly followed by laughter by both the scouts and the scoutmaster. The laughter eventually led to a silence as the scouts scoured their minds for the next scary story to share when they all began to hear a familiar tune, not too far off into the distance. The cabin provided a decent amount of soundproofing However, the unnatural tune found its way slithering through the cracks and frame of the cabin, like some old venomous serpent coming to bring ill tidings. It took the group only but a moment before dread had struck them all in the gut. The sound that they were hearing was the same song on the radio that they had encountered earlier that day. White here, 
Mr. Dawson said while standing up, unholstering his pistol again and opening the cabin door. He wasn't out there long before he came back in. The eerie tune crept off into the night, out of earshot, yet the bad feelings that had dragged here remained. All of our ears strained to hear more of the music, but it was gone. Out of earshot, yet the bad feelings that had dragged here remained. All of our ears strained to hear more of the music, but it was gone. At this point of the evening, we decided the best thing to do was to stock up on firewood, keep it near the stove, but most importantly, keep the cabin door closed. Mr. Dawson took the only available room to sleep in while the rest of the scouts spread it out their sleeping bags around the dim but still warm wood-burning stove. The smooth crackling of the fire provided a calming effect to our young minds. However, the treacherous evil we had encountered earlier still dwelled in the shadows of uncertainty. No amount of security could make us feel safe while out in these woods, but the lock cabin door would have to do. Our nightly routine of inappropriate jokes was sidetracked as none of us wanted to disturb the quiet air that kept us hidden inside the cabin. Despite the high anxiety and fear that we all were experiencing, the five miles we hiked up to this cabin had taken its toll on us. Much like the fire in the stove, our minds slowly dwindled into darkness, and we all found ourselves fast asleep. I don't remember falling asleep, but I do remember waking up. It felt as if I hadn't even fallen asleep in the first place. The first thing that I noticed, before anything else, was it. Standing in the nearest window, roughly four feet away from me, was a gaunt creature. At first I thought it was an old man, but it didn't take long before I realized that it wasn't. Its skin was gray and wrinkled like the bark of an old tree. Its eyes were sunken like dark pits that had no end. I couldn't see the eyes themselves, but I could feel their icy gaze violate me as it scanned its unholy sight upon me. For the brief moment that I was the only one awake, this creature and I shared a tormenting few seconds of silence and fear. I was paralyzed, but I could tell that this thing was delighted, that I was petrified. It seemed to feed off my fear like some kind of grotesque parasite latching itself to the most vulnerable part of my soul. I thought this would be the most horrific thing I'd ever have to encounter in my life, but I was wrong. The hideous creature that was only separated by a thin paned window began to do something horrifying. The silence was broken by the familiar singing of that eerie tune from earlier. This creature was now singing it loudly while also trying to do what I could only assume to be dancing. The creature moved rigidly, like its body was stiff from decay. Its dancing almost felt like a taunt, like it had me right where it wanted me, and there was nothing I could do to escape the inevitable doom that was sure to come. The singing caused me to break the trance of fear and allowed me to finally scream to alert everyone else. All the scouts slowly woke from their blissful dreams that granted them ignorance to the horrors that laid outside. It didn't take them long to see what I was screaming at, and they also followed in screams of terror. Mr. Dawson was a heavy sleeper. Even with the screams of the scouts and the creatures singing quite loudly, he lay tucked away in the other room. Two of the scouts were brave enough to open the door to the other room and wake the old scoutmaster, to hopefully rid us of this terror. Once awake, the scoutmaster knew almost instantly what was going on. He hopped out of bed while only wearing his evening apparel, which consisted of some socks, old faded boxers, and a white t-shirt. He grabbed his pistol and made his way for the door. Our screams then turned to shouts and pleads to stay inside, but the old man was determined to do what he wanted. He unlocked the door and before he opened it all the way, the creature stopped singing and rushed the door with an unnatural bolt of speed and fury that I'd never seen before. The door flung open, hitting poor Mr. Dawson right in the face, causing him to fall violently. The fall probably did more damage than the door, as he let out a loud huff of pain when he landed. His face streamed blood quite quickly, which soon began to run onto his t-shirt. Despite the door hitting him and having the wind knocked out of him, 
Mr. Dawson was able to sit upright and aim his pistol at the creature, whose figure now stood in the doorway. His aim, despite the blood obscuring his sight, was rather on the mark, as the gunshots briefly illuminated the cabin with flashes of orange light coming from the pistol. Chunks of the creature blew off, but the bullets didn't seem to phase the creature. The creature's quick burst of speed quickly closed the gap between itself and Mr. Dawson. The next thing we all knew, the creature's nails gripped into his head much like someone were to palm a basketball and lifted him off the ground. Mr. Dawson let out screams of pain as the creature then lifted the screaming Scoutmaster and then began slamming him down head first into the wooden floor. Mr. Dawson sustained two powerful hits before his screams were silenced. The creature continued until the floor began to break under the high force of slams. Once lifeless, the creature then dragged Mr. Dawson out of the cabin and off into the woods. All of the scouts were either screaming or crying. Our only leader who was responsible for keeping us safe had been viciously slammed into a pulp effortlessly, all right before our eyes. One of the older scouts jumped up and slammed the door shut while locking it. All the other scouts began to place furniture around the door to provide a barricade to our only line of defense of that creature. The hour was late in the night, but there was no chance that any of us were going to find sleep after this gruesome event that just unfolded in front of our innocent minds. It took the troop around a good 30 minutes before we began to calm down. It didn't dawn on us right then, but we eventually realized that our way back to town was a five mile hike in the very forest in which this creature lived. If we were to ever make it back out of here, we would eventually have to take the chance and hike back. An hour later, just when we thought things were going to be calm, we heard the same chilling tune off in the distance. Much like before, the creature was also dancing, except this time it began to twirl something. It had two items in each of its hands. The closer the creature got, the better we were able to see that the creature was twirling the arms of the scout leader that had been ripped off his body. The scouts began to scream again as the creature danced around the cabin. The creature wasn't trying to get inside the cabin. It was just taunting us again. The creature eventually threw the arms at the cabin, making a loud thud, and danced its way back into the woods. The sun eventually made its way back into our lives, as we spent the longest night of our lives waiting for the creature to come back to eat us. Once the sun came out, the creature had yet to make an appearance. The scouts began to theorize about the creature. Maybe it doesn't like light. Why does it sing that song? Is that a demon of some kind? These were the ideas that we all shared with one another. We finally came to the conclusion that the creature was a demon of some kind, from a dark place and that it didn't like light. That's why we hadn't seen it since the sun came up. We finally came up with a plan to get out of here. We were going to split up into two groups and hike back. If the creature were to get one group, then the other would have a chance to get away. As we were getting our plans all figured out, we saw someone come out of the wood line. With the events of last night, we had all forgotten about Mr. Carlson coming up today. Mr. Carlson came walking towards the cabin while carrying all his stuff when another figure appeared behind him. Mr. Carlson was about 30 yards away from the cabin and was in the middle of us and the other figure in the woods. We all began to scream for him to run to us as we tried unblocking the door for all the furniture was still there. To our surprise, the figure behind Mr. Carlson was Mr. Dawson. For a brief moment, we were all very confused to what we were seeing. Did Mr. Dawson survive the attack from the creature? Mr. Carlson stopped as he turned around to see Mr. Dawson standing in the wood line. Our shouts must have been muffled by the cabin as he seemed to ignore us and walk over to Mr. Dawson. Once we were able to get the cabin door unblocked, we were finally able to yell at Mr. Carlson to tell him to run to us. In response, Mr. Dawson began to dance and sing much like the creature we encountered earlier. This wasn't Mr. Dawson. It was the creature imitating him. We all left the cabin and sprinted to Mr. Carlson to pull him inside, but the creature began to transform back into that hideous form. 
Mr. Carlson watched in horror as Mr. Dawson transformed into the most terrifying beast he had ever seen. Like before, the creature grabbed the head of Mr. Carlson and dragged him off into the woods as Mr. Carlson screamed for his life. Some of us took the opportunity to run back into the trail and hopefully make it back while others ran back to the cabin. My fear overtook my body as my mind instinctively ran on the trail leading back into town. The five miles went by quickly as my adrenaline carried me most of the way back. Once I reached the base of the trail, my adrenaline had been flushed from my body as well as the handful of scouts that had followed me and we collapsed in front of a family that was unloading a minivan for a hike. We were somehow able to find the strength to scream at them that our scout leaders were dead and that they should call the police. The police came and rounded up the scouts that made it back and questioned us about where the cabin was. We gave them the correct information and made their way off into the woods while the paramedics took us to the hospital. The remaining scouts that stayed back in the cabin were found inside. All of them had been killed. The door had been broken down and their bodies thrown about. They had no leads on who or what had did this and they ended up closing that part of the trail that led to the cabin. I haven't been back in those woods since. Not just those woods, but any woods in general. My warning goes out to those of you who might find themselves in the woods this time of year. If you hear crying, just turn back. Nothing good will happen if you investigate. Travis rode silently through the misty mountains of Washington as he glanced out the window to only be met with a bleak landscape. It was about a week ago at this time that his mother broke the news to him about his father's accident. The crash itself wasn't fatal, but Travis was starting to wish that it was. What good is it to survive a car crash if you're mostly mangled and will probably be in a coma for the rest of your life, he thought. Travis's mother looked over briefly and saw that her son's countenance had greatly changed since she'd given him the news about her husband's crash. Travis, he could wake up at any time. Some people's comas only last a couple days. Travis had seen his father since and knew that that wasn't going to be the case. Jennifer, being the creative mother that she was, had to find a way to take her preteen son off such a horrible event. The school year would end in two weeks. However, she figured that since her son had perfect attendance and nearly perfect grades that he could just skip straight into summer break. But this alone wouldn't solve anything. Travis would just mope around the house or play Xbox while his mental health would decline. Jennifer needed to get her son somewhere where he could be productive but also around family to help cheer him up. She came up with a brilliant plan to send Travis to Dale. Dale was Travis's uncle but also his father's fraternal twin. Not only was this a perfect idea for Travis to be around his favorite uncle, but Dale also worked as a forest ranger in one of the national parks in Washington. As fate would have it, Dale's intern for the summer was not able to renew his work visa in time and thus he was left with an availability for a capable intern to assist him for the summer. When Jennifer called, Dale knew immediately that this would be a perfect solution to both of their problems. Travis loved Dale but his father being in a coma trumped his excitement. Jennifer kept driving in the Washington countryside while trying her best to create a normal conversation rather than all the other talks about the crash that they've had in the past week. So, uh, you excited, bud? She asked in a hopeful attempt to mend whatever feelings had been hurt from previous arguments. Travis paused and contemplated whether he wanted to continue fighting or just make up with his mother before he left for two months. Not as excited as you, he replied coldly. Travis, we talked about this. I'm not dumping you off to your uncle so I don't have to deal with you. Travis remained silent, feeling slightly guilty for taking his frustration out on the only person that was there for him. You're right, Mom. I'm sorry. Travis chirped up a few minutes later, causing his mother to grab his hand and gave a light squeeze. Your uncle tells me you're in for a big summer. Jennifer exclaimed while still focusing on the mountain highway. Oh, really? Travis responded intrigued. What do you mean? I thought you said he was like a forest cop or something. Jennifer chuckled at this. Forest cop? 
Who told you that? Yeah, Dad would always call Dale that one forest cop. Jennifer and Travis both laughed, seeing how even in a coma, that his dad was still making them laugh. It was a brief and lighthearted moment that faded just as quickly as it started, but it was exactly what they both needed. A good note to end on, especially with all the hardships of the previous week. Jennifer pulled off the highway exit and continued down a few miles before arriving to the entrance of the National Forest. Out front, parked off to the side of the entrance, was a custom and lifted jeep. Dale was standing out front, giving directions to a foreigner couple that were clearly tourists. Travis and his mom parked the vehicle in the closest available parking spot and walked over to Dale, who was still struggling to give directions due to an obvious language barrier. Eventually, the conversation ended, and Dale was able to properly greet his nephew and sister-in-law. Whoa, there he is. Dale said excitedly while messing up Travis's hair. Travis gave a sheep a smile as he was still not exactly excited that his whole summer of playing video games had been forfeited to being out in the woods with his uncle. This will be great. This will be even better than Scout Camp. What rank are you again? Dale said unaware of what happened last fall. Jennifer gave an uncomfortable smile and responded. Travis is no longer in the scouting program. There was an... She paused, trying to think of the best way to put it without reminding Travis of the horrors he endured in that cabin. An incident. But we're past that now. Right, Travis? A brief thought of Travis's scoutmaster screaming for help entered his mind, but quickly faded. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm over scouts, Travis lied. Dale nodded reassuringly. Well, that's okay. There's still a lot of great things you can do out in the woods that I can teach you. Travis forced a smile and hugged Dale. Why don't you load your stuff up in the jeep and I'll show you where we'll be staying for the summer. Dale then hugged Jennifer and reassured her that things were going to be okay. Hey, Gary's a strong guy. He's going to pull through. Dale whispered to Jennifer as Travis was out of earshot, trying to retrieve his bags. Jennifer's eyes began to swell with tears. I'm not so sure about that, Dale. Jennifer responded while pulling away from the hug and making her way back to Travis, giving him one last hug before hopping into her car and driving off. Travis and Dale shared an awkward moment before they both jumped into the jeep and made their way into the forest. The long drive in the beautiful forest helped Dale and Travis get reacquainted. By the end of it, they were telling jokes and singing out loud to classic songs that they both enjoyed. Eventually, Dale pulled up to the front of the ranger station, which was a sizable cabin-like structure, but oddly enhanced in a way that looked like it could handle military combat. Out front were other ranger jeeps, and occasional rangers entering or exiting the station. Wait here, bud, Dale said while jumping out of the doorless jeep and entering the station. Travis couldn't help but notice the sheer size of the forest and all the beauty inside. It had been a while since he had been in the woods and forgot how beautiful it was to be back. While Travis was admiring the scenery, one of the tourists of the park approached Travis in the jeep. Hey, how do I report something to you guys? The middle-aged man requested from Travis before seeing that he was clearly a preteen. Oh, sorry. I need to speak to a ranger. Unsure of what to do, Travis said that my uncle could probably help you. He should be out in any second. Sure enough, Uncle Dale exited the station with two ice cream cones and a smile on his face. We got the machine working again, Dale said while licking the ice cream. Dale handed a cone to Travis and, and the tourist piped in. Hey, how can I report something to you guys? The worried tourist inquired. Dale was doing his best to not spill his ice cream in the jeep and said, Oh, sure thing. You can follow an official report inside the station. Ask for Barbara. She's the nice one. Just curious, what's going on? The man had already started walking towards the station when he stopped to talk to Dale. Yeah, we've been having issues of people coming into our campsite at night. We're in a trailer, so we aren't exactly in danger, but I don't want people stealing our stuff from our campsite. Are you sure it's not an animal or something? Have you seen anyone come into your campsite? The tourist paused for a moment. I haven't seen anyone, but... We can hear people talking right outside our camper. We don't understand what they're saying, but it's definitely a person. How strange. 
Well, definitely file a report and I'll keep my eyes open. Dale smiled as he continued with his ice cream and started up the jeep. Dale and Travis continued their way deeper into the forest as Dale filled in Travis on what to expect this summer. So, technically, you're not allowed to stay in the ranger station since you're not a ranger, but I was able to pull some strings and I volunteered us for fire watch duty. Meaning that you and I get to stay in the fire tower, Dale said with excitement. Travis could feel a smile creep across his face as he always wanted to go inside one. It is fire season, so we'll have to actually keep an eye out for any blazes in the area, but most of the trees are fairly green, so we shouldn't have anything to worry about. Travis paused as he wanted to phrase his next question the best way he could. Dale, have you ever experienced anything weird in the woods before? Travis said nervously. Oh, of course. There was that one time an elderly couple got really high off of shrooms and went streaking in the forest. That was plenty weird. Travis nearly spat out his ice cream as the response caught him off guard. Both of them shared a laugh as they pulled up to the base of the gargantuan fire tower. Here we are, Dale said while putting the jeep in park. The fire tower had exceeded Travis's expectations. The tower itself must have been at least 100 feet, maybe more. Hope you don't mind the stairs, Dale said while getting Travis's bag out of the back. The two made their way up to the top, which took them about 15 minutes at a leisurely pace while they both talked. But back to your question, I have seen weird things. Your father told me about what happened to you and your troop last year, so I don't want to startle you with some of the things I've seen, but if you're ready, I'll tell you. Before Travis could respond, Dale's walkie-talkie blared, calling for Dale's assistance back at the station. Roger that. Be there soon. Dale responded while handing Travis his pack near the top of the stairs. Looks like duty calls. Make yourself at home, but don't touch any of the equipment or drink any of my beer in the fridge. I counted, and I know how many I have, Dale said in jest while messing up Travis's hair again and descending the stairs. Travis continued up a few more flights of stairs before finally reaching the top. Inside the fire tower was a rather impressive setup. There was a large map on the opposing wall that looked like the outline of the park. Inside the map were numerous marked locations that had different colors that looked like landmarks. The rest of the tower looked like a makeshift office with a bed and a fireplace stove. On the other side of the room was a movable cot and a basket of candy and beef jerky sitting on top. Behind the cot was a handmade sign that said, Welcome, Travis. Travis smiled while digging into the basket to see what goodies his uncle got him. Time slowly dragged as Travis waited for Dale to return. Being bored, Travis began to snoop around to see what the tower had to offer him for entertainment, but to his dismay there was only an old radio. He then turned on the radio, but didn't know what station to put it on, so all he got was static. Sitting on Dale's bed was a leather-bound book that seemed to be worn. Travis, not thinking twice, picked up the book and opened it to reveal what happened to be Dale's work journal. At first glance, the journal was boring and talking about some tasks that he had to do around the park. But as Travis continued to flip through, he was startled to see photographs taped inside the pages. The photos were of Dale and other rangers in different sections of the forest, but things slowly began to get more disturbing. The pictures were now of campsites, but no one was in the pictures, at least at first. Travis then read one of the entries of the photographs to gain contacts, but was left even more confused. April 26. Campers at Campsite 17 failed to check out of the campsite on time. When I went to confront the campers on the site, all the camping materials were left unattended. As per protocol, we gave them an extra day to check out, but upon returning the next day, nothing had changed. I called into the local police to report multiple missing persons, but nothing came of it. The next page was slightly more ominous, but more disturbing in nature. May 3rd. I received reports of screams by multiple campers late at night. My report to the ranger station was that of a mountain lion coming back to the park to mate, but I had no proof of paw prints or animal droppings to support this claim. The next page got even weirder. May 17th. The lights in the sky returned again. It has to be some type of military aircraft since it gives off no sound. 
However, we are nowhere near any airbase that I know of. August 8th. The station received reports of the woman again. No one is allowed outside after dark. August 12th. Bodies were finally found of the missing campers back in May. The bodies were... Travis' eyes widened as he tried to process all the information when his reading was cut short by the sound of someone walking up the fire station stairs. Not wanting to be caught reading his uncle's journal, Travis quickly placed the journal back to where he had found it and sat on his cot. Dale entered the station with a small bag and handed it to Travis. Here's some dinner. Travis opened the brown bag to see a plastic wrapped sandwich and some chips. Dale walked over to his bed and grabbed his journal. Oh wow, I can't believe I left this out. That could have been mad. Dale said as he walked over to his desk and placing the journal in the drawer while closing it shut and locking it with one of the keys off his keychain. Why would that have been bad? Travis responded, pretending that he hadn't already glanced at a few pages. Oh, no reason, Dale lied. Oh, what channel does that radio work on? Travis asked while unwrapping his sandwich. Oh, the radio. Yeah, that only works for emergencies. Sorry, probably should have told you that. Travis was surprised by what little technology the rangers used while they were out in the field. Hurry and eat. I want to show you some cool places before the sun sets, Dale said while packing up a backpack. Travis practically inhaled his sandwich as the two got ready and made their way down the long sets of stairs. Before descending, Dale stopped at the door and locked it using two separate keys on two different locks. Why did you lock it? Isn't there no one else allowed to be in this area of the park? Dale stopped and pondered before answering. How do I start this conversation? Uh, well, sometimes people or animals find their way out to this area by mistake. Recently, weird things have been going on in the park, so it's always good to cover your bases. But it's nothing you should worry about. Dale grinned reassuringly. The two made their way down the long sets of stairs and jumped into the jeep. Dale started it up and blared the radio while winking at Travis. This radio works, he said jokingly. With the two hours of sunlight, Dale showed Travis a good portion of the park while telling him stories of him and his father when they were younger. Travis for a moment felt as if life was normal again. That Travis had no other problems other than whatever was in front of him at the moment. But he knew deep down that that wasn't true. Uncle Dale was just like his dad except... Uncle Dale would occasionally swear or sing out loud lyrics to his favorite songs. After seeing a couple of cool sights, Dale drove him to the base of the waterfall where other tourists were also viewing with their families. Hey, I'm really glad you're going to be here with me this summer. I think we're going to have a blast. Do you remember how you asked me if I'd seen anything strange? Well, as a matter of fact, I have. Listen, I'm not trying to scare you, but this park is different different than the other ones. We have special sets of rules that even I need to follow in order to be safe. The biggest one is that no one is allowed outside after dark. Make sure you stay on established trails, don't go into unknown caves, and, you know, the usual stuff. Also make sure at night don't pay attention to anything that happens outside. I know that sounds weird, but the woods have a way of playing tricks on you which will get you very lost if you let it. But you're a smart guy. I'm not worried about you, Dale grinned again. Having read what was in Dale's journal and now hearing him say this was definitely weird. Wait, so people aren't allowed outside after dark while they're camping? How does that even work? Travis inquired. We ask people to stay in their tents or at the very least their campsite. I know it's weird, but just trust me on this one. Dale and Travis were making their way back to the fire tower when Dale's radio buzzed again. Code orange in the Pinewood campsite. All available rangers, please report with caution. Ah, great. Uh, I need to go to this. Let me drop you off at the tower with my keys, and I'll see you later tonight. Oh, and uh, when you see me later, I want you to ask me what your dad's name is before you open the door for me. It will be a code that only you and I will know. But the tower has windows. I could just look out and see you at the door and just let you in. Dale shook his head. Travis, make sure you ask me a question that only I would know. Again, just trust me on this. Yeah, sure. 
Dale dropped off Travis with the keys and tore off into the darkening forest. Travis took his time going up the stairs as things slowly kept getting weirder for him. There was something going on in the park that Dale wasn't telling him. But why? What was he trying to protect him from? Travis waited for his uncle to return in the dimly lit fire station, but time just dragged on. He tried his luck opening the drawer containing the journal, but it was still locked from earlier. There was literally nothing for him to do, since there was no TV and the radio was only used for emergencies. Eventually, he heard footsteps climbing the fire station steps, and sure enough, he heard a knock at the door. The forest was now dark, and all the internal lights of the station created a mere effect on the windows, making it only reflect what was inside rather than allowing Travis to see out. Travis instinctively began unlocking the door when he heard his uncle's voice from the other side. Wait, ask me a question first, Dale yelled, slightly muffled from being outside. Oh, yeah, right. Um, what's my dad's name? Dale instantly answered, Gary, and Travis opened the door. Dale walked in with wet hair and a different outfit rather than his ranger's uniform. That was a messy call. I had to take a shower afterwards at the station, Dale chuckled. Sorry for leaving you for so long. Turns out the code orange was more like a code red, and we had to get the police involved, but it should be fine now. Oh, well what was the problem? Travis inquired. Dale paused as he realized that he didn't think of a good cover story for what actually happened. Well, uh, someone tried lighting one of the bathrooms on fire. It's just probably just some protesters or something. Dale lied poorly. Anyways, I managed to steal this from the break room at the ranger station. Dale plopped down an old box of Monopoly and a couple of root beers. I thought this would be fun to play. Travis smiled as he loved a good board game. After a couple of hours of playing, both Dale and Travis agreed that it was way past bedtime. Both of them fell asleep quite quickly since they were both exhausted, but for some reason, Travis woke up a few hours later. The light inside the fire station was still on, giving the room a warm orange glow and Dale was asleep facing the wall. Travis stretched as he tried getting comfortable again when he heard a slight tapping on the window near the door. It was probably some type of bug or a moth being attracted to the only light in the forest. As Travis glanced around before closing his eyes again, he saw the side of Dale's bed. His journal laid next to it. This might be the only chance. Travis crawled over to the journal and picked it up while still laying on the ground. Travis flipped back to August 12th to finish what he was originally reading. We found the bodies from the missing campers back in May, and I wish we hadn't. All the bodies were found by a poor old couple, who had gotten lost and stumbled across them. The five missing campers were decapitated, and hanging upside down a good ways up into the trees. The worst part of this was that they were all missing most of their skin. Identifying the bodies would be incredibly difficult. The police were of no help as their investigation consisted of two officers asking some of the campers a few questions, but that was it. No follow-up or anything. Me and the other rangers have been uneasy since. August 23rd. More campers had been found, but this time in their camper. It was only two people this time, but a similar result. Both heads were missing, but their skins on their bodies were mostly intact. Attached to the journal entry was a poorly taken photo of inside the camper and of the two bodies. August 25th. The lights in the sky came back, this time much closer. Again, me and the other rangers are baffled by the lack of noise these aircraft make. Could there be a connection between the killed campers and the lights? September 7th. Some of the rangers have been acting strange. I have caught a few of them just standing in the middle of the forest and staring at nothing. Has the job gotten to them, or are they just high at work? September 23rd. Someone found the altar and reported it to the station. When arriving to the alleged scene of the altar, it had moved again. That would explain the murders. Make sure to find it and burn it before more people get hurt. October 7th. I saw one of them. I forgot what they looked like, but now I'll never forget. I made sure to notify the camp nearest where I saw it and had them relocate their campsite. I probably saved their lives. 
Why are they coming so close to us in the forest? Travis was filled with fear and questions. The light tapping had ceased, but a knock had replaced it. A chill went down his spine as he dropped the journal and shot up to see who was knocking at the door. The light inside still created the mirror effect, so Travis paused and flipped the lights off to see who was at the door. Once the lights were off, Travis took a second for his eyes to adjust to the darkness before he was able to make out a small outline of a figure standing at the door. Before Travis could alert his uncle, the figure spoke to him from outside. He knows you're here. You should have never came back to the woods. Travis stood petrified as he knew exactly who the figure was referring to. That's impossible. That happened hundreds of miles away. There's no way he followed me this far. Behind Travis grumbled Dale, still half asleep. Who are you talking to? Causing Travis to nearly jump out of his skin. There's a person at the door, Travis whispered. Dale shot up and went to the desk and pulled out a pistol, and by the time he got to the door, the figure was gone. Dale opened the door and checked the stairs before coming back in frantically. Did you get a good look at the figure? Was it a person, or was it something else? Did you talk to it? Dale asked. I only saw an outline, and I may have said a few things to it. Dale paused and looked at the stairs again. Did the outline at least look human? Yeah. If I had to guess, it looked like the shape of an old woman with crazy hair. Dale let out a sigh of relief. Thank goodness. Well, what did she say? Travis paused as he uncovered painful memories of his scout trip and running away from the skinwalker that had killed both his scoutmasters. I think something might have followed me here, Travis whispered. I don't know exactly what it is or how to kill it, but it can change shapes. Dale paused. He then walked over to his desk and wrote on a piece of paper and handed it to Travis, with a single word on it while putting his fingers to his lips. The paper read, Skinwalker? Travis nodded. Dale began to panic. Ah, oh, great. What time is it? Dale checked his watch. It read 3.14 a.m. We have about three more hours till sunup. Then when the sun is up, we'll head back to the station and call your mom. We can't have you out here. Dale said frustrated. Right then, the emergency radio blared on. Dale, come in. This is Code Red. Both Dale and Travis jumped at the noise. Dale grabbed the radio and responded. This is Dale, over. We have a Code Red. We need both of you back at the station immediately. Over, the radio replied. Come in. We can't come in now. Those things will be out there until sunup. We can't risk that. Sure you can. Everything will be fine. Just come to the station. Over. Dale paused. This isn't right, he whispered at Travis. Who am I speaking to? Over. The radio remained silent. Which ranger is operating this radio frequency? Over. The radio responded in a different voice than before. Come to the station, Dale. Bring us the boy, and we'll spare you. Dale turned away from the radio and went back to his desk and began packing things into his backpack. We can't stay here, Dale said. Pack your things. Travis and Dale spent the next ten minutes packing before making their way outside to the stairs. They quickly descended the stairs and made their way to the jeep. Travis still felt exposed in the dark forest sitting in the doorless jeep as Dale put it in drive. We can't go back to the entrance. They already have the station. We need to go out the service entrance on the other end of the park. That will take us hours, but the sun should be up by then. As Dale started the jeep, screams in the distance could be heard coming from the entrance of the park. Dale tore off into the forest trails as the screams seemed to multiply in the distance. Gunshots could be heard from various types of guns as they fired. Visibility was poor, as the cool night air supplied a slight fog that seemed to hang in between the trees. Dale put his high beams on and gave Travis instructions. In the back of the jeep is a pistol I need you to carry. It's a revolver, so it only has six shots, but I have a bag of ash bullets in my backpack. The bullets are specially prepared to kill those things, but I only have so many. 
I'm going to get you out of the woods and then I'll have to head back in to help the other rangers. Worst case scenario, if we get separated before I can get you out of here, try to find an altar. You'll know it when you see it. For some reason, the skinwalkers won't go near it, so you'll be safe for the time being. Dale continued driving in the dark forest at high speeds when suddenly a deer appeared in front of the jeep. With the poor visibility and the high speeds, all Dale could do was hit the deer while trying to stay on the road. The deer's body hit in front of the windshield, obscuring the view, causing Dale to swerve and hit a tree. The jeep, although equipped with seatbelt, ejected Dale and Travis into the woods, since neither of them put their seatbelts on. The deer that was pinned between the jeep and the large tree began to transform into a large skinwalker, while Travis and Dale writhed in pain on the forest floor. The jeep held the skinwalker in place as Dale and Travis eventually got to their feet. Fuel began to spill out of the damaged fuel tank underneath the jeep as the skinwalker tried to free itself from the twisted metal prison. Dale got up and ran to the back of the jeep and grabbed his bag as well as the gun and handed Travis the spare revolver. We need to keep going, Dale said while lighting the Zippo lighter and tossing it underneath the jeep. The jeep quickly caught fire and the skinwalker's screams became more frantic. The two continued a light jog down the path as the jeep finally erupted in flames, causing some of the nearby trees to catch fire. Don't worry, the fire will alert the nearest town and they'll send us help, Dale reassured. The screams from deep within the forest wasted no time in catching up to Dale and Travis as they did their best to limp their way down the path. Flames began to grow in the background, giving off little light but also providing a wall of flames, creating a small barrier for the skinwalkers to cross. Thirty minutes down the trail, Dale searched frantically with his flashlight in the nearby woods for something, but Travis didn't know what it was. That's when Travis heard the all-too-familiar tune not too far behind him. Travis's eyes widened in the dark, as he knew that the skinwalker was out especially for him to finish the job. Right here, Dale exclaimed as pointing off into the trees, to the right, shining his flashlight. The music got louder as Travis continued in pain. Dale led Travis into a clearing into the woods, where dozens of bodies hung upside down from trees, creating a small circle. In the middle of the circle was a grotesque statue made from sticks and bones, resembling some type of forest demon. The circle can't hold both of us, as he shoved Travis into the circle and took off down the trail. Wait, don't leave me here, Travis cried as he pleaded for Dale to stay. Dale quickly left the area, and Travis could see a few skinwalkers follow after him as a distraction. The fire in the distance began to grow even more, giving the false sense that the sun was rising. Travis began to cry, as he knew that he and his uncle were about to die. The singing was so close now that he knew that the skinwalker could see him. There you are. The skinwalker said from within the darkness. You should have known better to be out in the woods. I was never going to stop looking for you or your friends that got away. Finally, a figure emerged from the darkness and the skinwalker appeared in the clearing as it danced and sang, knowing that there was nothing Travis could do. Travis aimed his revolver at the creature and fired, but the creature quickly darted back into the darkness and laughed even harder. Ash bullets? Your uncle really thought that that would save you from me? Great effort, sure, but you have to hit me for those to work. Other skinwalkers began to come into the clearing and Travis fired in their direction, hitting one or maybe two of them. Twenty skinwalkers began to enter the clearing as they all laughed and danced their way towards the circle. Travis quickly ran out of bullets and the creatures then began to swarm. However, as they did, they all stopped right outside of the invisible boundary of the circle. A Wendigo altar. What are the odds? Well, I hope you're comfortable because we're not letting you out of the circle alive. The fire will kill you before sunrise. Travis crawled to the altar which was in the middle of the circle and cried even harder. 
The skinwalkers continued to dance and mock him, saying how good his flesh would taste and which one of them would get to wear his skin, when Travis heard a strange sound. When Travis touched the altar, he heard a voice in his head. This is the mighty forest spirit of the Wendigo. What is your desire? Travis removed himself from the altar and touched it again, but this time with his hand. The altar repeated the same phrase, but clearer in his head. You know I can kill them for you. All of them. You would even have time to save your uncle. Travis responded, but in his mind. Really? How? What would it take? The eyes of the altar began to glow red, and the makeshift mouth began to open. Allow me to taste of your flesh, and my spirit can come forth, but I'm greatly hungry, and I require a great sacrifice. Sure, anything. What is it? Let me eat your hand, and I'll kill them for you. Travis paused, as he legitimately considered this. My hand? He whispered. Not thinking, he inserted his left hand into the mouth of the altar, and it slowly began to bite down onto Travis's hand, hard. The initial crunch was the worst as he could feel every teeth bite and grind his bony hand to a pulp. Travis screamed in horror and pain as the altar began to grow into a living, breathing creature and took another bite of his forearm. Stop, 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 stop! Travis screamed. You're eating my arm! The Wendigo took one more bite, removing his forearm. The skinwalker stopped dancing and looked on in terror. The Wendigo removed Travis's arm and tossed him inside the circle. The Wendigo transformed from a bony figure to a truly terrifying beast and exited the circle. Some of the skinwalkers tried to swarm it, but they stood no chance, as the Wendigo tore their limbs off effortlessly. Travis did his best to watch the carnage take place, but the blood loss was beginning to get the better of him. The last thing he saw was the Wendigo gouging the eyes of the skinwalker that killed some of the Boy Scouts before he blacked out. Travis woke up a few days later, but was no longer in the forest. Instead, he was in a fluorescent white hospital room. What remained of his arm ached, as well as most of his body. Once he awakened, a small alarm notified the nurse, which quickly entered the room to check up on him. Accompanied with the nurse was his mother and two men in suits. The mother quickly rushed over to the bed and hugged him as she began to cry. I can't believe what happened to you. Are you okay? Travis tried his best to speak, but his lungs hurt when he tried to talk. Why does it hurt to breathe? Travis asked. Honey, they found you in the middle of that awful fire. It's a miracle you survived. Where's Uncle Dale? Is he okay? Jennifer looked at him with sad eyes. He still hasn't been found yet, but I'm sure he's okay. I do have good news for you. Your father, he woke up yesterday, and he asked for you. He wants to see you once you feel up to it, she said. Sure thing, Mom, he said with slight pain. The nurse escorted the mother out of the room, and the two men in suits remained. One of the men closed the door and took a seat close to Travis's bed. Hey, there you are, sport. You're quite a fighter, the agent said with a slight chuckle. <laughs> Where are my manners? I'm Agent Johnson, and this is my partner, Agent Borsky. We just got assigned to this case you're involved with. Does Operation Wendigo mean anything to you? Operation Wendigo Operation Wendigo was enacted in 2013 by the FBI due to the National Park Ranger Service reporting the highest cases of missing and or attacked campers by creatures in the woods. Normally, the FBI gets reports of incidents in the national parks when something of significance happened, like the National Park Skinwalker Incident, which was recently declassified. The names of the cases do not necessarily reflect actual events in the case, but rather what has been reported to us by the park rangers, most of which are dramatically created, mainly to show the level of severity of the case. Anyway, sorry for the preface. My name is Agent Johnson, and I was assigned to Operation Wendigo with my partner, Agent Borsky, back in November. 
Agent Borsky is rather new to the Bureau and hasn't been hardened by the cruel nature of the job. Borsky is a religious man, I believe, which is perfectly fine, yet I have found that to become an issue in the past with other cases. We are not the first agents on this case. They didn't tell us how many sets of agents they had before, but we are able to look at the case file to see all the previous notes and logs. Most of the time looking at case notes, there is a slight disconnect between each different sets of agents, as you would suspect, since not everyone looks at things the same way. Agent Borsky and I are driving to the National Park early one November morning, and he's reviewing the case notes aloud while I'm driving. It appears that in July of 2013, there have been 12 missing persons and 37 reports of animal attacks in just this park alone. That's essentially an attack a day. That level of attack is extremely strange, but it gets weirder. Some of the reports of the creature, not animal, was that it was bipedal and it had claws. All of the attacks were at night, so the victims were not able to get a better description than that. It didn't give us much to work off of, but Borsky and I were able to make assumptions on the case. I do not believe in the paranormal, nor am I religious. I believe that everything has a scientific or at least a logical explanation. My guess, based on my experience, was that this was either a cult or a human trafficking ring hiding in the park and covering up the abductions as people going missing in the park. Borsky nodded at my assumption, but I could tell that there was something in his mind suggesting that there was more to this case than what science could explain. You know, every year we do find an animal that we had no idea existed, Borsky said. They're mainly smaller species, but every now and then we do find a large one. I glanced over to Borsky, taking my attention off the road for a brief moment to give him a skeptical look. Do you think that there's an unknown animal attacking these campers that we don't know about? I said with extreme skepticism. My question brought Borsky back to reality, but not all the way. Well, you never know, he said. He continued reading the case file, although silently, and would every now and then share something interesting. Ooh, look at this. There's been reports of ghost sightings as well, he said with excitement. My eyes practically rolled out of my head. Ghost sightings? Really? Every place is haunted depending on who you ask, I said with a smile. Borsky continued reading silently the entire way to the park, and we met up with some of the park rangers. We pulled into the ranger station, and we were greeted by two rangers. It was late in the afternoon, so we had a good couple of hours before we called it a day. We asked to be filled in on what they knew about the situation. Unfortunately, they knew very little since the park rangers were instructed not to talk about anything that happened in the park. I glanced at the rangers and noticed that their uniforms were typical, but that they were carrying rifles. Whoa, boys, quite the firepower you got there, I said. Well, this is bear country, and I am sure you're aware of our missing persons numbers as of late, they responded. They walked us inside of the ranger station, and we met with all the other rangers. They were also equally useless to us in terms of information, since no one really had an idea what was going on. We were then informed that there had been an attack that morning, and that we were able to join them in their investigation, if we wished. We joined them and rode down to the campsite in one of the rangers' jeeps. We arrived at the site, but everything else had been roped off. The site had two small camping trailers parked next to each other. One of the trailers had been knocked over, and both had large claw marks on the doors and sides. What happened here? said Borsky. Well, it looks like we had another bear attack last night. These people probably left some food out, and the bears did the rest, said the ranger. I was amazed at this damage. Bears will attack people, but they will avoid it if it is possible. The bears probably figured that there was food inside, but I've never seen a bear so persistent enough to knock over a camping trailer to do so. Are there any survivors? I asked. I was met with a solemn head shake. How many do we figure were camping here? I asked. Looks like ten campers, responded the ranger. Ten campers? There's no way a bear or even a couple of bears would eat ten campers in one attack. Our options are that there's either something menacing in these woods, or that this was a cover-up. I was beginning to be envious of the rangers and their additional firepower. I wasn't getting spooked, but something about this and what I was looking at was making me uneasy. 
We walked up to the campsite to see that most of the bodies were either taken by the alleged bears, or that the paramedics had already gotten them. There wasn't much for us to see other than the blood and claw marks. The blood was everywhere. I had been on many cases where there were fatalities and even where I killed some people, but none of that compares to what I was looking at. There were parts of the trailer that had been so bloodied that it began to pool in small puddles. We checked the locks on the door, which indeed were locked, but it appeared that the door frame of the trailer gave in, allowing whatever intruder to enter. National parks do not allow guns of any kind, so these campers were literally fish in a barrel with nowhere to go. I was beginning to doubt my traffickers theory due to the carnage that laid before me. Typically, traffickers want to traffic people that aren't harmed, or at least not dead. Whatever had happened here didn't seem to care whether or not people had died. We left the crime scene after conducting a small investigation, which only resulted in us documenting the claw marks on the trailer. The trailer was made of a somewhat thin sheet metal, but even then, I'm unaware of any kind of bear that can do that. Perhaps I don't know enough about bears. We rode back to the station with some of the rangers, and I was glancing around the park, admiring the beauty. I was trying to take my mind off of what I'd just seen, and this was doing the trick. The park nestled up to this beautiful mountain that had snow on top of it. It was November and it was chilly out, but snow had yet to fall. As I was admiring the landscape, something caught my eye. It was the color yellow that popped out from the lush green forest. I focused on the color to see what appeared to be a small child wearing something yellow off in the distance. It caught my attention but I thought nothing of it. We made it back to the ranger station and the sun had a good ways to go before setting. However, the rangers were already closing up the station. Wait, why are you guys closing up? Aren't you guys supposed to be open at all hours? I was then informed due to recent events of the campers being attacked at night that they have set a curfew for both rangers and campers that no one was allowed outside after dark. We were given the option to stay at the station, stay in town, or there was a fire tower a few miles in the forest that wasn't occupied by anyone during this time of year. Borsky and I looked at each other, and we both nodded. We'll take the fire tower, I said. Borsky and I both being of a detective mindset, knew that since no one would be at the fire tower, that we could investigate at night without interruption. That would be the only way to really get answers. The rangers escorted us out to the fire tower, and to my surprise, the fire tower was quite large. It reached over the tops of the trees. They dropped us off and we hiked up the stairs. The stairs had an interesting feature that you could retract the first 15 steps, much like the ladder on one's attic. The inside of the fire station was quite impressive, having not been used in a few months. There were three beds, a small stove, and a table with a few chairs around it. We didn't have much stuff other than our packs and our case notes. Granted, being an FBI field agent, we were already carrying our equipment that we needed to investigate. Once we put our stuff down, we climbed back down the stairs and started walking in a random direction that hopefully would lead us to a campsite. Our walk would prove pointless, as most of the campsites were empty. We didn't know if this was because of the off-season, or if that campers knew what was happening. We walked a good mile or so, and we eventually found an old-looking trailer parked at one of the campsites. As we walked over to the trailer, I saw a yellow flash again. I looked over and saw the small girl standing about 50 yards away. She was just standing there, looking at us. I waved to the little girl, and me and Borsky walked over to the trailer. The trailer was old, and the tires that supported it were flat. Not a good sign. We knocked on the trailer, and we didn't get a response. Granted, it was getting dark, and there was a really good possibility that this trailer was abandoned. We left the trailer and went back to where we saw the girl, but she was gone. Our options were either to continue down this now darkening trail to find the girl, or head back to the fire tower. I glanced at my watch to see that it was about 7.30pm, but the trees were already blocking much of what was left of daylight. We decided to head back and come back tomorrow with some of the rangers. We hiked back and by this time, it was pitch dark out. The sun had completely set and the trees seemed to add a layer of thick darkness that would swallow the light of our flashlights. It was probably a good idea that we turned around when we did. 
We went up the stairs to the fire station, and we retracted the first 15 steps, much like the attic stairs I had mentioned earlier. We obviously did this to prevent any unwelcome guests from coming up the stairs while we slept. To be completely honest, having seen the campsite earlier, it actually bothered me to where I'd actually feared for the first time in the field in a long time. We reached the top of the fire station, and due to our brief yet tiresome hike, we fell asleep rather quickly. I dreamt that night of something rather horrific. I dreamt that I was in the woods alone, walking down the path that we saw the small child on. I could feel eyes all around me, and a strong presence of evil. I continued down the path until I came across something hunched over in the middle of the trail. I didn't have a flashlight, but I could still see in the dark to a degree. The thing hunched down seemed to be eating something. I could hear the crunching and tearing of bone and tissue. My legs didn't move, but I could feel myself getting closer. The creature from behind looked very similar to a human, if it wasn't for the antlers on its head. Its back was pale, its muscles looked dried and withered, as if you left meat in the freezer for too long. I was now close enough to see that the creature was eating Agent Borsky. Borsky was still alive and thrashing around in pain, although the creature easily kept him down with one hand. My fear overcame me, and rather than helping Borsky, I tried to run, but I couldn't. I think this notified the creature, and it stopped eating Borsky to look at me. The creature's face was completely human, although its ears, lips, and nose had withered off its body and were no longer there. It bore yellowish fangs, and its eyes were blood red. Its claws were large and rugged, unlike that of a bear or a tiger. I could now understand the damage of the two trailers from earlier. The creature stood up and swiped at my throat, but before it could land its killing blow, I woke up inside of the fire station. When I woke, I was covered in sweat. I was completely terrified. I glanced over to Borsky, and he was asleep. Something outside caught my eye, and I could see outside the window that there was something just outside of our door. I grabbed my gun and my flashlight, shined my light outside to see a familiar flash of yellow. I went to the door and opened it, and saw the girl in yellow now starting to go down the stairs. How is this possible? How did she get up the stairs since we removed the first couple of steps? I was baffled. I tried talking to her, but she just kept moving. I shouted to Borsky and told him that he needed to wake up and follow me. He groaned and began to get up, and I followed the girl down the steps. I couldn't ever get a good look at her. Whenever I would shine my light directly at her, she would completely disappear, only to appear a few more feet ahead of where she once stood. I knew that something about this was unlike any experience I had ever had, and that I had no explanation on what was going on. Borsky finally caught up to me, and I told him that I think that this girl we're following is a ghost. I couldn't see his face, but I knew that his eyes were wide, and that he believed me. She then led us down the dark trail. Even though it was dark, and we didn't know where we were going, I felt comforted as if I was being led by someone I could trust, and that I was in good hands. She ended up leading us a good distance away, down an old path that didn't look used anymore. The path was barely noticeable, even having a guide to show us where it was. The trail was completely overgrown. Borsky and I had to push through in order to follow the girl. We walked what I would guess to be five miles down this path, but it was probably more like two. The weeds and brush made it very difficult to get anywhere, and we had no idea how we were going to get back. The girl finally stopped and pointed at what appeared to be a very old cabin. The girl would no longer disappear when I shined my light at her, and I noticed that her dress to be very out of date. She looked as if she was once a pioneer of some kind. Her skin was pale and her eyes were dark. Although I knew I was looking at a ghost, I wasn't afraid. She never said anything, but just pointed at the cabin. Borsky and I knew that asking her questions would be pointless, and that whatever questions we had would be answered by entering the cabin. We shined our lights on the cabin and saw that it was not of this time. We looked back at the girl to see that she had disappeared. We pressed on the cabin door, which gave us much resistance, but eventually squeaked open. Inside we could see what appeared to be a family cabin. There were still plates on the table and an old makeshift furniture placed around the room. 
I saw an old musket that must have been the late 1800s. As I was admiring the rifle, I noticed an engraving on the butt of the gun. Jeremiah, it said. Forsky called me over and shined his light to a place on the floor next to the fireplace. The floor was stained with a dark reddish brown, and it was next to a yellow dress, much like the one we saw on the girl. After a quick investigation, inside the fireplace, we were able to find small but human bones. What happened here? Borsky said. I paused and used my detective mind while putting together what I knew about some of the pioneers. I have heard of pioneers getting snowed in or not having enough food back in those days, and were forced to make a difficult decision to survive. Borsky, I think someone ate this girl. We checked the plates on the table, and unfortunately, it did confirm my theory. The bones on the plates were small human bones. As we came to this conclusion, we heard a sound outside. It sounded as if something large was pushing itself through the overgrown brush with great speed, as if we found something that someone did not want us to see. We quickly ran to the door and locked it with the old locks, yet still working. The cabin did have old and somewhat opaque windows, yet we could still see shapes through it. The door began to shake violently, which shook the entire cabin. A creature then broke a window and tried to enter through it, but it was too large to fit. We could now see that the creature resembled that thing I saw in my dreams. It was tall and it looked withered and pale. Its head had antlers and its face lacked features. Forsky and I opened fire on the creature, which appeared to harm the creature, causing it to panic. While trying to enter the window, one of its antlers got stuck inside the window. The creature tried frantically to remove its large head from the window, but it was stuck. Forsky and I fired most of our ammo, but I told him to wait. Seeing now that this creature couldn't move, I walked over to it. I picked up the old rifle and pointed to the name on it, saying, Jeremiah? The creature looked at me with knowing eyes. It clearly recognized the name. What did you do? I said to the creature. The creature's panic had stopped, and it sat there as if it was in shame. It let out a growl, and a low gravelly voice said, we were hungry. I then lifted my pistol and shot the creature in the eye. The back of its head came off and a thick dark liquid splattered the inside of the cabin. The creature then spasmed before laying lifeless in the window. Whatever this thing was, it was clearly dead. I took the bones from inside, as well as the yellow dress, and dug a small grave with an old shovel I found inside. I placed the bones on the dress inside and covered the small grave with dirt. Borsky and I left the creature in the window and made our way back to the ranger station. At this time, the sun was beginning to rise. We could hear the birds chirping and we felt a sense of dread lift from the forest. We finally made it back to the station and we were greeted by some of the rangers. We told them rather confidently that we had single-handedly solved the missing person's problem. They looked at us confused and we all hopped into the jeep. We showed them the hidden trail that led to the cabin, but to our horror and dismay, the creature that we had recently killed was no longer in the window. It was missing. It was right there, guys. I'm telling you. It had these big antlers and claws. The rangers nodded their head as if they'd seen this before. In fact, they didn't even seem remotely surprised. We know, fellas. Apparently legend has it. If you eat another human, you turn into those things. I then recalled what the creature said to me before I killed it. We were hungry. We, more than one. Borsky, how many plates are on the table? He went inside and quickly confirmed what I had feared. There's five plates. It wasn't just Jeremiah that ate this girl. It was a whole family. There are more of these things out there. Operation Wendigo, Part 2 after relaying the information back to headquarters, Agent Borsky and I were relieved from the case. Borsky was reassigned to another case and I went on leave. The events that had happened over the short time had really stuck with me. I started developing severe anxiety, I couldn't sleep at night, and my eating habits were off. The worst part, I'd have to say, about all of it, were the dreams. For whatever the reason, I couldn't stop reliving those events of that night in my dreams. Except every time I would dream about it, 
things would slightly change. Change for the worst. Each and every dream since has both been hyper-realistic and incredibly dark. The endings of the dreams would greatly vary, to which every time we would lose to a horrible death, I would either get decapitated or eviscerated, all while my partner Borsky would watch, helplessly. After seeing many doctors and specialists, I resorted to basically anyone that could possibly help me. After spending thousands of dollars and basically receiving no results, I was basically forced to go anywhere. One day, I had to take my car down to the mechanic in the less desirable part of town. While I was down there, I couldn't help but notice only a few blocks away, there was a fortune teller. I had a couple of hours for my vehicle to get repaired, and I was genuinely just curious as to what kind of information they could share. Upon entering the dimly lit building, I couldn't help but notice all of the weird decorations that littered the building. It looked like an old Halloween shop from the 70s. I almost left, but I had this weird feeling. A feeling of forbidden knowledge about to be acquired. My hair on my neck stood on end. Out of the back room, an old woman wearing a ton of adornments came out. She beckoned me to follow her, which I did. She led me back to another room that was even more dark and even more grotesque with decorations. In the center of the dimly lit room was a table that had a glass orb on top of it. She sat me down at the table and she sat at the other side. To my surprise, she moved the glass orb just regarding it and grabbed my hands. Her hands were old and wrinkly and had a leathery texture to them. Now that I could get a better look at the woman, I happened to notice that her eyes were completely white. Either she was literally blind, or she was wearing contacts for effect. Nonetheless, it was still startling. You haven't been sleeping, shrilled the old woman while still holding my hands. Uh, yeah, I haven't. She grasped my hands tighter and started to sway back and forth. You have done things to the dark forces. I paused. I was caught off guard. What, what do you mean? What dark forces? You have taken one of their own, and they want payment. There's no way that this woman could have known what had happened. That mission was classified. There wasn't even a report in the news. Instead of confronting this woman on how she knew this information, I just remained quiet. The dark forces will continue to plague you until you make things right. How do I fix it? How do I make it right? The woman let out a cackle that much resembled that of a witch. To fix what you have done, you must go to their dimension. And how do I do that? And what do I do once I'm there? Well, there are many ways to enter. A doorway or stairs, even a mirror could lead you there. But what to do when you're there is the question. That is for you to decide. The enchantment of the old woman had worn off in my mind. I was now no longer curious and rather frustrated. Much like the other options before, trying to find solutions to my issues, this avenue had led me to a dead end. I didn't know what the rate was for this fortune teller. I had been with her for about maybe five minutes, so I left a $20 bill on the table. I got up and I left. The woman didn't say anything when I left. She didn't protest. I assumed that the payment was adequate, and that was that. I was able to go back to the garage, get my car, and go home. Later on that day, I got a bizarre call. It was from the bureau. They didn't go into a lot of detail, but they said it was regarding the Operation Wendigo case. Despite all of my issues and the disorders that I've gained from that case, I agreed to meet up and at least listen to what was going on. The next day, I headed down to the headquarters again having another terrible night's sleep the night prior. After having a quick mission briefing, I soon discovered that most if not all agents that they have deployed to this case had recently gone missing. That included active and inactive agents. I asked about Agent Borsky and if he was still around. They declined to share his specific assignment, but they told me that he was doing well. They said that ever since Borsky and I left the case, Ever since we killed that creature, 
that things have gone ten times worse, with the other field agents either disappearing or not wanting to take the case. They really had no options. The mission director offered that, if I took the case, that he would double my salary and that I could ask for anything to help assist in this case. Knowing that I had unlimited resources and a double salary was a nice touch, but in all honesty, I wanted to do this for me, to be able to get my sanity back. I made the choice, and probably the mistake, to accept the case. I listed my demands for the case and the resources that I would need, as well as the personnel. The mission director immediately accepted. After a week of prepping and training my team, we finally headed back to where it all started. I personally requested two SWAT teams and one tech team. All in all, I was in charge of about 20 people, something that I wasn't necessarily accustomed to. However, when you're in the bureau, leadership comes naturally, mainly because everyone just listens to what you say. We finally arrived to the national park, and to my surprise, it had been completely deserted. There were no forest rangers, there were no campers, and everything had been blocked off. This was definitely for the best. Those people would have just gotten in our way. To be honest, this was more of a military exercise than anything. The vehicles that we brought with us were heavy duty. I specifically requested heavy duty so whatever was out here couldn't easily enter. We had about four pickup trucks, two trailers, and one large cargo van. Obviously, this is a bit of an overkill, but safety was top priority. We parked all of our stuff in a circle. The front entrance to the state park was closed, so we had to enter by foot. The first thing that we wanted to investigate was the forest station. We wanted to see if it was inhabitable or if there was anything we could do to reinforce it while we stayed here. I anticipated the forest station to be inoperable, and after a quick investigation with both SWAT teams, that appeared to be the case. My initial thought of investigating the forest station was that it would be covered with bodies, but thankfully it just looked to be abandoned. I ordered a quick inspection of the facility. I asked them to look for any weak points, and most importantly, if they felt safe staying there. They came back to me later on saying that the facility looked fine, they were just worried about the windows, to which I agreed. We ended up just setting up camp on the side of the road, outside of the national park. Obviously, this wasn't the most ideal situation, however, it appeared to be the safest. I did my best to brief my team on what to expect out in these woods. Despite the professionalism and the severity of what was going on, I could still tell that they were doubting me. Granted, the things that I said I wish weren't true. Nonetheless, the fact remained that there were still four Wendigos out in these woods. The plan was fairly simple, kill the remaining Wendigos. Granted, that's easier said than done, but still, we had to try. I was going to have the SWAT teams investigate the cabin and hopefully find some clues. My tech team was going to set up cameras all throughout the forest, hopefully we'd find something. I didn't share this with the team, but the events earlier with me and the fortune teller still stayed in my mind. I was still looking for some kind of portal, something that would lead us to another dimension. Nighttime eventually fell, and I had my teams get prepped for the coming investigation. We would do the majority of our investigation during the night. That would be the only way that we'd get actual results, however dangerous it might be. My tech team had all afternoon to set up cameras throughout the entire forest, at least places we thought we'd see activity. Night fell and my teams got ready. I readied up with one of my SWAT teams when I was recommended to stay back. I then remembered that I was the mission leader. I probably shouldn't be doing anything dangerous. I agreed and I stayed back. I told my SWAT team that I wanted them to investigate the cabin. The one that Borsky and I investigated to see if they could find any more clues. I had the first SWAT team to go investigate, while I had the other set to stay back and protect us. Both sets of SWAT teams were outfitted with body cameras, that way we could see what they saw. The first SWAT team drove a good portion of the way into the national park, when they saw a large structure blocking the road. At first I hadn't recognized it since it wasn't standing upright. 
But after a few seconds, I soon remembered that that was the fire tower that me and Borsky stayed in. It had fallen over. Since it was blocking the road, my first SWAT team was forced to get out of their truck and walk the rest of the way. I asked them to investigate briefly the fire tower, see what might have caused it to fall over. If memory served correctly, the fire tower's base was made of wood. I wanted them to see if there was any cracking of the wood of any kind. Perhaps high winds might have caused it to fall over, as unlikely as that sounds. I could see on their body cameras distorted images of the base. The poles that stood upright looked like they'd been chewed through or slashed at. Just from seeing this alone, I could tell that my first SWAT team was starting to take this more seriously. I then ordered the SWAT team to investigate the actual building itself to see what remained of the inside. In the actual building part of the tower, the SWAT team was able to discover three bodies of federal agents that were investigating the case. We were able to discover that the three bodies were indeed missing agents. Right then and there, I made a satellite phone call to my supervisor telling him what we found. I requested an ambulance to recover the bodies. Upon the request, they asked me if I needed more backup, to which I declined. That was the entirety of the phone call, and I went back to watching the monitors to see what my first SWAT team was doing. They continued hiking into the woods to the coordinates that I had given them for the cabin. After 30 minutes or so, they finally arrived. I could tell just from the body cameras alone that my SWAT team was quite frantic. They were looking around quite frequently, as if multiple things were catching their attention. I radioed in. SWAT Team 1, what's the situation? It took them a few seconds to reply, but when they finally did, they said, Uh, sorry, we keep hearing things off in the woods. It sounds like there are multiple. My heart skipped a beat upon hearing this. I asked them to get to the cabin quickly and set up defenses. Before any of them could respond, I started to hear gunfire. Oh, great, I thought. We continued to monitor the body cameras as it appeared that they were firing into the woods. I told them to hold their fire and just get to the cabin. They should be somewhat safe there. A small portion of the SWAT team's cameras had shut off, which made us fear the worst. The SWAT team leader radioed in. It appears that we lost two SWAT members. Should we return back? My SWAT team of six is now down to four. Great. I told them that the cabin wasn't too far away. If they could make it there, we'd send a rescue team in to help them out. I told them that I'd personally come in myself to help them. I was prepping the second team when my tech team told me something surprising had happened on one of the monitors. One of the SWAT members that had gone missing, his camera had turned back on. The images from the camera revealed many disturbing things. First and foremost was that of an apparent Wendigo. Despite it being through camera, even the image of it still made me shudder. But it wasn't that that necessarily disturbed me so much. It was the other thing I saw. In the background behind the Wendigo, amongst the thick trees that lined the forest, appeared to be what looked like a staircase. The staircase didn't seem to be connected to anything. It was just by itself. My first priority was to make sure that my team was secure but this was definitely something that we needed to look into. I readied up my second SWAT team, and I made sure I had communication to my tech team as well as my first SWAT team. We loaded into the truck, and I drove us off into the dark forest to rescue our first SWAT team. I had the radio to the first SWAT team on to make sure that our communication was open. As we started driving into the forest, we could hear gunshots off into the distance. After a few minutes of driving, we finally reached the fallen fire tower, with the other truck parked outside of it. We had to get out and hike the rest of the way. I checked in with my tech team to make sure that they were okay, and they were. I also checked in with my first SWAT team, and they told us that things were definitely trying to get in the cabin, and that we needed to hurry. And hurried, we did. The second SWAT team, led by me, started a light jog into the woods, headed for the cabin. The entire way we were jogging, we could hear gunfire coming from the direction we were running towards. We needed to make sure we got there in time. The first SWAT team radioed in frantically, telling us that it got more members of the SWAT team. 
I reassured them that we were only a few minutes away and not to worry. We continued jogging when we started to hear something that was unsettling. Something that I didn't think would make me feel uneasy, but it did. It was the sound of silence. The gunfire had stopped. This was not a good sign. I radioed in to my first SWAT team, but no answer. I radioed in to my tech team to see what had happened, but unfortunately all they had to share with us was bad news. The Wendigos had taken all of them. We were too late. The situation went from bad to worst almost instantly. I had only one SWAT team left and no reinforcements. However, we do have confirmation on a set of stairs. We just don't know where. Upon hearing the news, I ordered my second SWAT team back and that we needed to get back to the truck as soon as we could. We then turned around and made our way back to the fire tower where we had parked our truck. As we hiked back, we got a sense of something following us. A few times, my SWAT members in the back would stop and scan the area behind them, causing all of us to stop. My anxiety began to pulse on my stomach. I knew what was happening. Despite being surrounded by my SWAT team, I was completely terrified. I knew that despite being surrounded by six highly trained SWAT members, that they were no match against four Wendigos. Our only hope of surviving any of this was for us to get back to the trucks. Right before we made it to the fire tower, I could hear gunfire coming from behind us. Instead of moving forward, we all took defensive positions. This obviously slowed us down immensely. I could see briefly through the flashes of gunfire what appeared to be only one Wendigo. The creature moved impossibly fast, and as it saw that we took defensive positions and better organized, it retreated. After a few seconds of waiting, we then started our hike back to our truck. Speed was our priority at the moment. We needed to get back. We finally arrived to both trucks that were parked at the fire tower. After a quick review of either truck, we then noticed that both of them had been destroyed. All of the tires had been flattened. Parts were strewn about everywhere. The method for us to get back to our camp safely had literally been destroyed. I could see the look of defeat on all of my SWAT team. They knew that the impending doom was going to eventually overtake us, that it was only just a matter of time. Around this time, we could hear growls and roars coming from all around us. Their method of being sneaky was no longer needed. They had us where they wanted us. My SWAT team formed a small circle, with me in the center. Before we could start our long and incredibly dark hike back to our camp, we were greeted with a horrible sight. A wendigo came from out of the woods and onto the trail, blocking our way back. It was taller than I remember, much more lean and lanky. Its features were immensely disgusting. The Wendigo was still clutching what remained of one of my SWAT team members. You should have never come back, the Wendigo said with a low growl. Upon hearing this, the majority of my SWAT team started to fire at the creature. However, the Wendigo simply threw the remains of the SWAT member at us and ran into the woods. Immediately, the three remaining Wendigos attacked us from all sides, essentially ambushing us. My SWAT team, as well as myself, were caught completely off guard. Our formation was completely dismantled almost instantly. It was practically every man for himself. A firefight immediately rang out in the night. Seeing that I was going to be outmanned, I had no choice but to run off into the woods, let my team distract them and hopefully I can make it out of here. I ran for what felt like 15 minutes before I saw a familiar sight, the flash of yellow the ghost girl from the case previously. She was pointing again. She was guiding me somewhere. Hopefully this would lead me back to my camp. I had no choice but to follow her directions. The gunfight from my team was slowly getting quieter until it was completely silent. It appeared that the Wendigos had finished all of them. However, this did give me a solid chance at escape. Hopefully I'd be far enough from the Wendigos to make it back. I would follow the directions from the girl in yellow and she'd disappear for a bit. She would then reappear later on, giving me further directions. However, the more I followed her directions, the more I realized that there were more bodies on the path that I was going to. Where was this girl leading me to? I radioed in my tech team to see if there was any way that they could get to me. They had absolutely no idea where I was. 
Since I'd been following those ghost girls' directions, I had no idea where I was in this forest. However, that soon became the least of my problems, as I started to hear one of the wendigos behind me. I was still formatted with body armor and a machine gun, however I was still no match for a wendigo. My tech team radioed in something quite surprising. Johnson, we can see you on one of the body cameras. You're near the stairs. I looked around frantically with my flashlight, and sure enough, there was a set of very large stairs randomly going nowhere in the forest. However, before I could investigate, I could hear the loud sound of a wendigo coming towards me. The ghost girl then appeared at the top of the stairs, pointing to her. I sprinted towards the stairs, but I was quickly intercepted by a wendigo. It had knocked me over with its large body and picked me up with its sharp claws. It had knocked my machine gun out of my hands. However, I still had my pistol on me, which I quickly drew. However, before I could properly aim and fire the weapon, the wendigo started to bite on my arm. The pain was immense, and it was a mixture between both a sharp pain and intense pressure. I could feel a warm liquid run down my arm, as the wendigo shook me like a ragdoll. My arm then became numb as I found myself flying through the air. I then had realized why the wendigo had released me. It had taken my arm off. With all the fear, pain, and anxiety that I was experiencing, I was also feeling lightheaded. I was losing lots of blood. With no other option, I ran over to my machine gun, picked it up with my remaining arm, and found my way going up the stairs. I started to fire at the Wendigo, but the bullets hardly did anything. I just kept walking up the stairs backwards as I continued to fire. The three remaining Wendigos came from out of the woods and helped in the attack. When they finally reached me, I was at the top step of the stairs. I had nowhere else to go. One of the Wendigos swiped at me, and I found myself falling back off the stairs. However, something happened. Something bizarre. Instead of landing on the cold, hard earth of the night, I had landed on soft snow, and it was daytime. I still had my machine gun with me, and my arm had been restored. The stairs were still there, but the Wendigos were gone. It appeared that the stairs had led me to another place, another dimension perhaps. However, all questions were quickly answered when I saw the girl in yellow standing before me. However, this time she was no longer a ghost, but in fact a person. She looked incredibly dirty, as if she'd been living in the woods for quite some time. Before I could say anything to her, she asked me for help. She said that her father was trying to kill her, because they ran out of food a couple of weeks ago and that they were forced to eat one of their own. When she caught word of what was going to happen, she ran away. I was briefly confused, but then I realized what had happened. Those stairs had sent me back in time. This was the only way I was going to defeat the Wendigos. I had to stop them from transforming in the first place. I figured if I just killed the girl and the family, that I would stop them from turning. But that seemed so wrong, even though it would essentially solve the problem. There must have been a better way. It then dawned on me what the obvious answer was. I needed to find these people some food. Seeing that I still had my machine gun, that this was completely possible. I told the little girl that everything was going to be okay, and that she needed to take me back to her cabin so that I could talk with her father. She obviously hesitated at the thought, but I reassured her that she was going to be okay. On the way back to her cabin, we saw a large deer which I shot and killed. The deer was quite heavy, but I was still able to carry it back to the cabin, although it took me much longer. Before we even knocked on the cabin door, the entire family came out and greeted us as they saw what we had. I'm pretty sure the entire family was crying as they saw that what they were about to do to their own family member. The solution was actually quite easy, however it was just difficult since they didn't have the proper tools for this time. I left the deer with the family, and I didn't say a word. As I headed back for the stairs, the man that I assumed to be the father introduced himself. Hello, my name is Jedediah. Thank you for saving us. Again, I didn't say anything. I just nodded. I had seen too many time-traveling movies to know that if I messed with the timeline too much, things could have gotten worse. However, I think providing a starving family with food would be acceptable. I made it back to the stairs and I went up them. I jumped off the edge again and I came back to what I assumed to be our time. However, when I came through I was no longer standing in a forest. 
Benstead, a very large town. The town wasn't terribly large, but it was incredibly beautiful. The stairs that I used twice before had now disappeared. I quickly walked around the town to see if I was in the right time period, and sure enough, I was. I walked over to where the cabin once stood, and to my surprise, the cabin was no longer there, but in its place was a town hall. In front of the town hall appeared to be some kind of statue of a man holding a deer. Below the statue on a plaque read, This statue is to commemorate the random stranger that provided much needed food to the Williams family in 1843. I then started walking out of town and I called my supervisor. Apparently I forgot what time it was and it took a couple rings before he answered. He didn't seem too terribly happy for me to call him at this hour, however I think the news made up for it. Sir, Operation Wendigo is a success. Having seen the success of Operation Wendigo, Agent Borsky was hand-selected for a special reclamation project named Dark Reach. For most of the materials of the operation, Dark Reach was considered classified since it was an ongoing operation, but some exceptions were made to fill in Agent Borsky. Long story short, a secret science base in the middle of nowhere had been compromised by unknown combatants. Agent Borsky sat skeptical when reading the mission briefing. How do we not know who the combatants are when it's a secret science lab? Surely we must have some idea of who these people are. The mission director was amused by Borsky's intellect and boldness. You're right, Borsky. We do have an idea with who is responsible, but nothing definitive. Since I have the clearance and the authority, I'm going to level with you. In 2009, our scientists made a breakthrough with time and space technology. They were able to create a portal to another dimension, or so we think. We have sent some people through with equipment, but the equipment is always immediately destroyed, and no one has ever returned from the portal. We think the conditions in the other dimension are too harsh for human life, so we took another approach. Borsky's eyes were wide with dismay. So who are the combatants taking over this lab? An advisor leaned over to the mission director and whispered something for a few seconds. The mission director nodded and said to the advisor, You're right, he deserves to know. Long story short, the director told Borsky that the only thing that they could think of that could survive difficult environments would be something that could shapeshift. They just so happened to have collected an asset from the National Park Skinwalker incident, and they used that to send through the portal. They're guessing that what has ever happened on the other side of the portal has caused the creature to adapt to this unearthly thing. We're going to send you in there and just make sure that the portal is turned off. It's a simple assignment, but you will have to go alone, and there will be no backup. Borsky was surprised by the no backup. Why don't I get any backup? The mission director responded and said, There's a good chance that whatever this thing is will manipulate your mind and shapeshift into your partner. That's why we have to send you alone. Borsky nodded and accepted the mission. They were able to give him gear needed for the mission, and they were able to relocate him out to the secret lab. The lab's entrance was well hidden, but also guarded by multiple people carrying machine guns. The lab looked like a door that was simply on the side of a hill. If there weren't any people there guarding it, he wouldn't have thought anything of it. Borsky was loaded with a machine gun, as well as wearing body armor just in case anything happened. One of the guards told him right before he entered not to talk to it. He took the advice and went inside. Upon entering the heavily sealed door, he could hear the latches close behind him, sealing him inside. He noticed that the power to the facility was off and that he was immersed in darkness. Thankfully, he had an LED light on the end of his rifle, so he turned it on. He continued down the long hallway. He was thankful to see the red glow of emergency lights above. It must have been the backup power. Porsky was able to notice that the further he went into the science base, the more sticky the ground was beneath him. Not a great sign. There was no personnel left over in the lab so he had to slowly make his way through on his own. Borsky's attention was at high alert. He was keeping his eyes peeled for that creature lurking in the darkness, but thankfully he saw no signs of it. 
He was hoping that he would just find the portal, shut it off, and get out of there without having to see or hopefully talk to that creature. That hope, however, was dashed when his flashlight caught something at the end of the hallway. Identify yourself, he shouted down the hallway, but no response. He slowly stepped closer and closer, hoping that one of the scientists were able to survive. Right before he was able to identify what he was looking at, the creature or thing bolted off to the left down a long hallway. Borsky tried to give chase, but was soon caught off guard when he looked down one of the hallways and saw a door glowing orange. Before he could walk down the hallway, he heard a voice in his mind. Adrian, I don't want to kill you. Adrian was Borsky's first name, which no one ever referred to him as. Adrian, you need to leave the portal alone. Humans need to suffer. Borsky responded out loud. You know I can't let you do that. I have to shut it off. Adrian slowly inched his way down the hallway while talking to this creature. The portal has shown me so much, Adrian. You should see as well. You know it will kill me. I can't do that. Adrian continued to step closer and closer to the door. The orange glow of the door got brighter. Borsky was about 10 yards away from the door when his flashlight caught something at the end of the hall. Despite the figure being at the end of the hall, he knew immediately what it was. It was his mother, right before she'd gotten in a car crash. She was even wearing the outfit that he last saw her in. She didn't speak out loud, but in his mind. Adrian, dear, please don't do this. You can come back to me. The portal will send you back to me. His mother continued to step closer and closer, slowly down the hall. Borsky lowered his weapon just enough so he wasn't pointing his gun at her. Can it really send me back? Is it possible? He responded. Yes, yes, it most certainly can. Don't turn it off. The figure that looked like his mother was now close enough that he could see the features of her. Her skin looked bloated, her eyes were dark and black. Her limbs looked twisted and out of place. The image of her was so repulsive that it immediately snapped Borsky back to reality. He immediately raised his rifle and began to fire. He unloaded his magazine into what was clearly not his mother. The creature immediately began to flail and scream while running down the hallway. Borsky made a dash for the room with the orange glow. Upon entering, he was able to see what was clearly a portal to another dimension, or at least what looked like one. Borsky was able to quickly discern what was the power source for this device, and immediately shut it down. Upon doing so, he quickly left the room and made his way back to the entrance. This would mean that he would have to go back into the hallway with that thing and make it all the way back. Borsky quickly left the room and sprinted back, all the while hearing screams that were a mixture of his mother as well as some feral beast. He stopped to look behind him and shined his flashlight, not seeing anything but hearing the screams getting louder and louder. It sounded as if whatever it was was getting closer to him, but he couldn't see anything. To his complete horror, he was able to shine his flashlight up and see that the creature was crawling on the ceiling and the image of his dead mother. This was the most horrific sight he'd ever seen in his life. Borsky was completely stunned in fear. The creature then lunged at him before he could react and pinned him to the ground. Right before the creature was able to bite his throat, a jolt of electricity shocked the creature in the neck and it jumped back. Lights to the lab turned on and personnel filled the hallway. Multiple agents with weapons came out of the doors and were quickly able to subdue the skinwalker. Out of the crowd of agents came the mission director smoking a cigar. Agent Borsky, you successfully completed the simulation. Congratulations. After two months of, and I quote, structural management, the nameless organization finally decided to reopen the national park in the early winter months. They hoped that, since most people do not visit this particular park during the winter, that this would give the forest rangers enough time to get the park back in working order. This would require a remodel of the forest station and a resupply of the resources needed. 
they had to rehire a completely new staff under the direction of the nameless organization. They didn't want word to spread of what had happened earlier, and they didn't want word to get out into the public. For those wondering, the United States government does not recognize nor acknowledge the existence of beings or entities that cannot be explained by modern science. They are either classified as ongoing classification or as an unknown threat. The first day of opening the unnamed organization brought in a mixture of both forest rangers and military personnel. The military personnel were to stand guard of the workers remodeling the forest station, as well as to accompany the rangers on their tasks. The forest rangers were to visit campsites as well as the facilities nearby and make sure that they were in working order. Both groups were unaware of what had happened previously at this park, thus they were confused at the level of security that was required to operate this location. Jason, a forest ranger that had transferred recently, joined the morning meeting that assembled outside of the forest station. Both the forest rangers and the military were mingling amongst themselves. Two black SUVs pulled into the parking lot, 20 feet away. A man dressed in a nice suit, accompanied by two men carrying machine guns, exited the vehicle and walked over to the groups. The entire group hushed down to a low whisper as the man in the suit introduced himself. Good morning. You may address me as Director Borsky. I have been assigned over this park. What we will be doing is rebuilding and fortifying this park here. It is very important to the United States government that this is done quickly and without delay. I have four rules for all those that are assigned under my authority. Number one, no one is to be out past dark. Number two, you will have a companion with you at all times. Number three, do not use the military issued road that leads into the park. And finally, no one is to speak to the public about what happens here. Any questions? The crowd remained silent since no one wanted to be the fool to ask. The director looked around and saw that no one raised their hands. Great, we're on the same page. The military is assigned here as a training simulation. The director and his two colleagues spoke to different department heads of the forest rangers in the military before leaving. We kind of stood around aimlessly while they were talking since no one was giving direction. That quickly changed when the director was done talking to the department heads. Once the director left, we were all paired into groups. I was paired with another forest ranger named Jackson and two military personnel named Nathan and Andrew. Off the bat, Jackson introduced himself to the group. He was in his late 40s and gave off a cowboy vibe. Nathan was newly enlisted, and you could tell he was a frat boy. Andrew was more of a family man that was serving his country out of duty. Despite the wide variety of personalities, I felt lucky to be in this group. Nothing is worse than being stuck with some hard noses. We were also given walkie-talkies so that we could communicate to the different groups. We were assigned to check on the furthest campsite that was across the park. It would require us to take a service truck and drive 40 minutes. Thankfully at this time, the thick morning fog had rolled away and the overall visibility was tolerable. As we drove, I got to know Nathan, the military guy, very well. We sat in the truck bed, while Jackson and Andrew sat in the front. They seemed to get along fine. Nathan showed me his issued weapon, which I thought was interesting. I thought that they normally issued some sort of rifle. However, they gave Nathan a shotgun with dragon breath rounds. This seemed out of the ordinary, but I was new, so I guess I didn't know what was normal. We arrived at the campsite at the back of the park. Everything looked like it had been there for months, which was actually the case. There were small amounts of trash scattered, but nothing unusual. We worked our way back and checked in on random campsites. Most campsites looked normal, while others looked like they were scorched by some kind of fire. The ground and nearby trees were black and gray. All of us got out of the truck and investigated the campsite. It was cold out, but there wasn't any snow on the ground yet. This area is very wet all year round, so to see it completely burned definitely didn't make any sense. It looked as if multiple people took flamethrowers and burned the camp. Jackson, the cowboy-like ranger, squatted down and touched the ground. You know, the odd thing about the char is, it only looks like it's covering the campground. He looked around as if he was uneasy. Something doesn't add up. Why do you military boys paired up with us? Nathan shot me a glance and I smiled. 
great. We've got a conspiracy theorist in the group, I thought to myself. Andrew remained quiet, but also scanned the tree line with Jackson. We got back in the truck and drove back to the ranger station. Considerable progress had been made on the remodel of the station, but was still incomplete. It was midday and we had food brought to us from the nearest town. After an hour of eating and laughing, all the assigned pairs went back out to finish their duties. Nothing happened that day, or at least no one said anything. At the end of the day, all the groups were assigned certain locations in the park that were close by to sleep in. They were either these heavy-duty trailers or located in one of the fire towers in the park. My group got lucky and we were assigned a trailer. We were given a strict curfew from 6 p.m. to 8 a.m. Under no circumstances were we allowed to be outside when it was dark. Thankfully, the trailer that we were assigned to was nearby other trailers and had cable. It was a bit awkward having four grown men share a somewhat rather close space. Jackson was fine as long as he wasn't talking about his conspiracy theories. Andrew barely said anything, and Nathan and I were basically old friends at this point. Night came, but we were already inside. Thankfully, it was early winter, and we still had sports to watch. The night went on, and the evening was uneventful. We certainly appreciated the curfew, and slept in till 8 a.m. for the first time in a while. We met up at the forest station that was still being worked on. They told us it would take us another two or three weeks to get the station ready to house us again. During the morning assembly, we were reminded to stay indoors during curfew. There were reports of people being seen outside in the woods that were unaccompanied. Nathan and I locked eyes. Who would do that, I thought. Our group was assigned to stay and guard the forest station for the day, which was easy enough. We just sat around talking with the other groups and watched the construction company slowly change the forest station more into a base. There was a light snow in the air, but nothing stuck. Jackson started talking to the other groups and asked them if they believed in Bigfoot or something ridiculous. The more I was around Andrew, the more I realized that he was socially awkward, but he was becoming more comfortable around us. Nathan and I were talking when another group's truck came barreling into the area and parked outside the station. Instinctively, all the guys in my group grabbed their weapons and walked over to the truck. In the bed of the truck appeared to be two rangers applying pressure to the neck of an army man. His throat was bleeding profusely. From my first aid training, I already knew that he was a goner. The forest ranger department head made his way over and walked in support from the unnamed organization. He was barely alive when they finally arrived, but all the blood from his face had been drained. Nathan and I looked at each other in horror after seeing what we just saw. The first ranger department had told us that the man was injured would be taken to the nearest hospital, but that they did get the bleeding to stop. That event made the rest of the day go by slower, but it also put everyone on edge. All the personnel were coming up with theories on what had happened to the poor man. Jackson's theory was that one of his group members slit his throat, which was obviously ridiculous. Other more reasonable ideas that were floating around was that a mountain lion was trying to land one last hunt before hibernation. Mountain lions were quite frequent in the area and extremely quiet when stalking prey. Night eventually came and the ranger station was still being modified. We had dinner and went inside before it got dark. All the department heads made final stops at all the trailers and fire towers to make sure that everyone was inside. We were all on edge with what had happened earlier. However, little did we know what horrors laid before us in the coming days. It was later at night when our walkie-talkie buzzed us awake. It was a group stationed in the fire tower on the other side of the park. Come in, this is fire station two. Is there anyone on our stairs? Being annoyed by being woken up, Jackson got up and turned off the walkie-talkie. Andrew asked, What if that's important? Jackson said, It can wait till morning. Ain't nothing else out here but us and them animals. I sided with Jackson and I went back to bed. The next morning we woke up and got prepared like normal. We made our way to the forest station and we saw that everyone there was conversing amongst themselves but were trying to be discreet as if they were trying to talk and not be suspected. I asked the group next to me what was going on, and they act shocked. Didn't you hear what happened last night on the walkie-talkie? 
I had a vague memory, but shook my head no. No, what happened? We turned it off. The guy in the group was about to say something to me, but the forest ranger department head interrupted and started the morning meeting. The head ranger told us what goals he had for us for that day. He also said that there were events that unfolded the night before that were currently being investigated. If you see anything weird, be sure to report it immediately to either department head. I was dying to know what had happened the night before, but no one would tell me after the meeting. Nathan was able to get some information from his military buddies. Apparently the group in the fire tower went missing. Everyone was on edge in our group, especially Jackson. The whole day Jackson had his gun with him. We made sure to stick together, even when we went into town to get supplies. The forest had changed that day, not just because what had happened in the fire tower, but we could feel an odd sense of something now lurking in the forest. We also got faint smells of something rotting from time to time, especially towards the latter part of the day. We considered at one point to search for the source of the smell, but Jackson told us that it was the sign of something unearthly walking towards us. I was going to criticize him, but a part of me felt like he was right. The day was ending, and we were trying to install some lights at this pavilion on the other side of the park. We let time get away from us, and the next thing that we knew, it was starting to get dark. This wasn't an issue since we'd be able to drive back in about 30 minutes, but it'd be close. We entered our vehicle and started to drive quickly. The visibility was low and was only getting worse by the minute. We hit an unexpected bump in the road. We hit the bump so hard that Nathan and I hit our heads on the roof of the truck. As we kept driving, it said that the truck had low coolant. It was getting darker and we tried to continue on our way but the truck sputtered to a stop about 10 minutes away from our trailer. We all looked at one another with wide eyes. We aren't gonna make it back before it got dark. Jackson, being the self-proclaimed leader, told us to hop out of the truck and to start walking back. Seeing that we were too afraid to argue and to find another solution, we followed Jackson. It was dark in about five minutes into our hike. The intense smell came back and I was beginning to feel what I can only explain as lingering death slowly filling my mind. We had flashlights in hand as we continued on the gravel road leading us back to camp. Andrew was in the back of the group, but I could see his flashlight. It would frequently shine behind us, as if he was looking for something. At one point, we heard some rustling coming from the trees behind us and everyone stopped to look. All of our lights were shining in a similar area where we thought we heard something. Jackson snapped us out of our daze and we kept hiking back. We were almost back when we began to hear a blood-curdling scream coming from behind us. A scream that was both terrifying, yet so human. This gave the group the needed motivation to sprint back to camp without stopping. The men forced their way into the trailer and quickly locked it. The feeling of dread and the horrendous smell had long left their senses, but their adrenaline was in full swing. It took them a minute or two before they realized that the close group of four was now down to three. Andrew, who was in the back of the group, was not inside. He must have been left behind. The group considered their options. Do they stay inside as instructed, or go back out into the danger and try to find Andrew? Nathan got on the walkie and asked his department head what to do. They responded with, You are ordered to stay inside. It is dark and no longer safe for you. Do not open the door for Andrew until the morning. That's an order. The group fell silent and stood there horrified. I spoke up and said, We can't just leave him here out all night. No one said anything. I knew that they were thinking the same thing as I did, but they didn't want to disobey orders. We sat there in silence and slowly thought about what we were going to do. Looks like Andrew would be spending the night outside. Later that night, when we were all in our own beds, not quite asleep, when we started to smell the same smell of death, I perked up and looked around. Our trailer had small windows on certain sections of the trailer. I got up and peered outside, but I couldn't see anything. It was far too dark, but I could see that it started to snow. Nathan saw that I was up and was looking out the window and asked me what I was doing. 
I told him that I maybe thought Angie would have came back by now, and I was looking for him. At that moment, our walkies came on. Jackson, there's someone outside your trailer. Do not open the door. Jackson creeped out of bed, rubbing his eyes, and walked over to the walkie. What was that? asked Jackson. There's someone outside your trailer. Stay away from the doors. Yeah, that's probably our guy Andrew. We lost him in the woods today, Jackson said annoyingly. Jackson walked over to the door and peered out the window. Jackson peered out, confused for a minute or two. Despite the orders, Jackson opened the door and went outside. Nathan and I looked at each other with complete horror as we saw that he left the door open. We both had the same thought to run after Jackson, but we stopped at the door frame. We saw that Jackson was only a few feet out, but he was barely visible. The walkie blared on again, telling us to get back inside. Jackson quickly turned around, ran back inside, and locked the door. We need to barricade the door, Jackson whispered. We started to move our beds and heavy furniture in front of the door, and right when we did, we heard a bang on the door. It was loud and barely shook the door, but it was enough to give us all a scare. What did he see? whispered Nathan. Jackson shook his head and said that he thought he saw a young woman crying. But when he went outside, he noticed that her face looked extremely old and decaying, like that of a corpse. She started to twitch and shake when she noticed me. The bangs on the door were getting louder and harder. The walkie blared on again. Guys, there's more coming to you. We're going to try to assist you. We heard more banging on the door, and the frame started to crack. Not much later, we heard the fire of automatic weapons outside. We could hear some bullets hitting our trailer. To our horror, we began to hear screams that weren't human. Banging on the door stopped briefly, and the gunfire continued. We laid on the floor hoping that the bullets hitting our trailer would miss us. The walkie blared on again. The bullets aren't doing anything. Get back inside. The gunfire eventually stopped, but the screeching continued. We could tell that there started to be human screams from time to time. We walked over asking what was happening, but no response. Things went eerily calm. The smell was thick in the air of dread and decay. We continued to lay on the floor out of fear if we made a sound, it would draw those things back to us. Despite us being silent, the banging began on the door again. Nathan got up and grabbed his shotgun, and I grabbed my service pistol. I could see out the window quick movements of shadows blur past us. They continued banging on the door, and the frame started to give. The door was about to give at any moment. I aimed my pistol at the door's window, where I could see matted hair, and I fired. Whatever was out there started screeching, but the banging continued. The top hinge completely broke, and part of the door had opened. Nathan fired his dragon breath rounds at the creatures, and they caught fire. To our surprise, the one figure that caught fire immediately fled. The screeching was more intense. Nathan fired again at the next creature. This creature made it halfway inside, but caught fire, and tried to turn around and run out into the snow. There were so many creatures pushing it inside, that all it could do was flounder around until it laid lifeless on top of the broken door. Fire seemed to be the only thing that damaged these creatures. Nathan was the only one with dragon breath rounds. Jackson and I tried shooting at these things, but they were not even phased. The creatures finally broke down the door and we could see what we were up against. These creatures were tall and lanky. Each one looked to be unearthly but slightly human at the same time. Nathan continued to fire at the creatures. Each one he hit caught fire, and they ran outside. Despite this new discovery, the creatures were too many and were likely going to overpower us. We heard more gunfire from outside. We assumed it was backup. Some of the creatures went outside while others kept coming in. One snatched Jason with its talent-filled hands and pressed him against the wall. Blood gushed everywhere as Jackson squirmed helplessly. Nathan fired at the creature pinning Jackson, and the creature caught fire. Unlike the other creatures, this one continued to attack Jackson, slashing at him with his free hand. A man with a hazmat suit entered the trailer carrying a flamethrower and igniting both the creature and Jackson. 
The creature was much more responsive to this and dropped to the ground. Jackson lay lifeless on the ground as his body smoldered to a crisp char. The man in the hazmat suit aimed the flamethrower at me and Nathan. Name and rank, the man shouted. Nathan and I were both quick to respond. The man in the hazmat suit hesitated for a few seconds, but eventually lowered his weapon. You'll need to come with me. The man in the hazmat suit walked outside to where there were dozens of people in hazmat suits. They were all carrying flamethrowers fighting these creatures that were coming in from all sides of the woods. There were four unmarked vans, one of which he guided us to. Nathan and I entered and the hazmat suit guy got in. He placed the flamethrower on the passenger seat and started driving. The hazmat guy got us out of there and started driving to the forest station that was still unfinished. We drove past it and continued to the military highway road that we were forbidden to be on. The road was still in the park area and was surrounded by woods. The night was dark and the snow rarely began to come down. The man driving was clearly panicked as he went faster than what we considered safe for snowy conditions. While we were driving, Nathan checked his shotgun. He noticed he only had two Dragon Breath shells left. The highway took us to the part of the park where we've never been before. The terrain became more rugged and mountainous. Everything was unfamiliar. The headlights beamed ahead and caught what appeared to be one of those creatures in the middle of the road. The man driving slammed on his brakes, but the conditions were so bad that he lost control. The vehicle hit the creature head on, but drove off the road and into the trees. Nathan and I were launched forward, slamming us violently into the seats in front of us. The creature was pinned between the unmarked van and the trees ahead, but continued to twitch slowly. The driver was unresponsive. The flamethrower was leaking fluid all over the seat. Nathan and I were dazed from the crash and slowly stumbled from the van. Nathan kept his shotgun, but I had lost my service pistol in the crash. I considered grabbing the flamethrower, but I saw that it was unsafe to use. There we were, just off this super restricted road that we should not have been on. To make matters worse, we were in the middle of the woods. We finally decided that our best bet was to continue on the restricted road and hoped it led us to someplace safe. I was lucky enough to still be wearing my ranger uniform and I had my flashlight in my pocket, which I took out and turned on. We could hear in the distance screeches and screams. We needed to hurry. We continued down the road for a ways when we saw a flashlight ahead. It was flashing as if someone was turning it on and off as if to signal us. We sprinted forward to find Andrew standing in the middle of the road. He looked rough, but still alive. We were so glad to see him, we didn't even think to ask what had happened to him earlier. Andrew looked at us with this empty stare. He noticed Nathan's shotgun. Andrew seemed to be looking at us, as if he was trying to size us up, as if he hadn't seen us in weeks. Does that gun shoot fire? Andrew asked. It was such a weird question, but we didn't know Andrew that well. Like I said earlier, I thought Andrew was socially awkward. He was always so quiet and hardly spoke. Nathan shook his head. They hate fire, Andrew said coldly without looking away from the shotgun. Look, we think to stay on the road is the best bet. Are you coming with us? I asked Andrew. The question snapped Andrew out of his trance and he nodded. I'll follow you, he said softly. We continued down the road for a ways. The snow got heavier. After 30 minutes of walking, the road then took a surprising turn into a tunnel that led into the hills. My heart sank as our only safe option would be to walk through this dark tunnel. Nathan led the way and I shined my light ahead of him to help him see. He had a shotgun ready and aimed as he walked. We walked into the tunnel that seemed to be well maintained. We continued in the dark tunnel until we couldn't see the entrance anymore. My dim flashlight sent small scattered beams of light in front of us. As we walked, we heard sprinting coming from the front of us. My flashlight had yet to detect anything coming when suddenly a figure appeared and attacked Nathan. Nathan, being caught by surprise, accidentally fired a round, missing the figure and illuminating the tunnel for a brief moment. The figure was now on top of Nathan 
and beating him with his fists. Instinctively, I jumped on the figure and got him off Nathan. All the while, Andrew watched us fight. After a few seconds of chaos, we were able to find the figure that attacked us. It was Andrew. Not the Andrew behind us, but there was another Andrew. There were two Andrews. The Andrew that attacked us told us that he thought we were one of those things. He then realized that there was another him, and he told us to shoot the other Andrew. The Andrew behind us got defensive and told us that he knew it was us, and he still attacked us. He was clearly a creature. Nathan swiveled his gun from one Andrew to the next, back and forth, debating on which one to shoot. Which one do I shoot, Jason? They both look the same! The two Andrews were now yelling at each other. They both looked identical. They were shoving each other so much that we got them mixed up. We had no idea which one was which. Nathan whispered to me, Dude, I only have one shot. Which one do I shoot? He said, panicking. One of the Andrews said, Just shoot us both. That's the only way to be sure. Nathan then swiveled the shotgun over to the other Andrew, who started to protest and shot. Flames erupted from the shotgun as the pellets clearly hit its target. Screams erupted from Andrew, but they were not like the screeches from before. He ignited into flames and lit up some of the tunnel. He fell to the ground without flailing. The other Andrew began to cackle a hideous laugh and transformed into this disgusting beast with twisted limbs and sharp teeth. Nathan knew right then and there he had picked the wrong Andrew. The creature imitating Andrew immediately attacked Nathan and began to eat him alive. The glow of the computer screen distributed an uneven glow across the darkness that filled the home office. Zack worked hard on his company project as he played Deftones on his AirPods, and taking an occasional hit from his vape while also checking the time. Despite the room being nearly dark except for the half dozen devices used to help Zack work, it was nearly 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Zack preferred to work in complete darkness to help unload his senses and to better immerse himself in his work. Zack was 37 and divorced. He had two children which both needed to be picked up from soccer practice at 6 p.m. He had to force himself to check the time or his work would inevitably consume him and they'd get left behind. Zack used to work for the NSA as a security programmer, the opposite of a hacker, but after the high stress nature of the job and the relatively low pay, he found it best to freelance his abilities to companies that paid more for less work. Zack was also a hacker in his free time, which was essentially all the time now. He would mainly wander the dark web and interact with political activists and find dirt on government officials. Having worked for the NSA and seen what the iniquities the government had committed, Zack felt that it was his duty to bring to light their wrongdoings, although in a more inconspicuous way than Edward Snowden. Zack also had $7 million in various cryptocurrencies, which made it difficult to stick his neck out for the common people since he had so much to lose. A random leak of information here, or an anonymous tip to random news outlets there, was all he did. He laid out the breadcrumbs and let the journalists do the rest. However, they seldomly ever did investigate the tips sent in to really make a difference. I looked down at my analog wristwatch to see that it was now 5.27pm. I began shutting down what I was working on to see that I just received an email. Normally, emails don't bother me, especially if I was in a rush, but this one did. First off, it was sent to my private email, which is something I don't give out, but also what the email contained. The email was a link to a website that had the phrase, the real truth, as the subject heading. There was no return email address. I stood mystified, only for a few seconds before returning to my task of breaking down my workstation and getting out the door. On the way out, I grabbed an energy drink and two Powerades from the fridge and left the house. I physically locked the front door rather than using Siri or Alexa. Being a hacker and a programmer, I knew better than to purposely place those devices that anyone could essentially access 
and do who knows what to my house. Once outside, I soon realized that the weather was no longer sunny, but a light rain had begun to fall. Seeing how I was already running late, I shot down the brief thought to grab a light sweater and just tufted it out of my Nine Inch Nails t-shirt and cargo shorts. I entered my 1997 Toyota Camry and fired it up. Despite being worth millions, I had yet to talk myself into spending it on a vehicle. I liked the Camrys because it lacked any sophisticated computer system like a Tesla that could be used to track me down or shut off my car, but it also gave my ex-wife the impression that I didn't have any money. Also Camrys just happened to be great cars. I eventually pulled into the soccer complex and saw that practice was just now getting out. I debated on whether to check my emails as I waited for my two children on my cell phone, but I made it a personal rule to never check my secure email on my cell for obvious reasons. The phrase, the real truth kept echoing in my mind. Was it some kind of political smear document of misaligned funds or something exposing underground organizations that were conducting nefarious acts beneath our noses? You'd be surprised at the kind of information that was out there on the public record that people simply do not search, either out of complacency or simple ignorance. Unfortunately, in my field, I have been exposed to those things that have been kept away from the general public, and for good reason. Some of the stuff that still keeps me up at night. The real truth is probably some kind of knockoff global warming campaign that wants me to donate money or something, and I'm just overthinking it. Before I allow my mind to wander any further down this ambiguous rabbit hole, a loud slap on my driver's side window pulled me back into reality. It was my oldest child, Kyle, slapping the window to let me know that the car was locked. The light drizzle had picked up since I had arrived to the soccer complex, and it was raining more heavily. I unlocked my car and popped open the trunk in hopes that my children had common sense to put their muddy equipment in the back, but... I guess that common sense is rare these days. Both my children entered the car and placed their dirty bags in my rear seats. My thoughts of deep contemplation had now shifted to annoyance. I yelled at them to at least close the trunk and the youngest one finally jumped out to complete the simple task, but not without complaining the whole time. The drive back to their mother's house was equally as annoying as well. I try to stay involved with the children, but they show little interest in interacting with their biological father. To be fair, I understand, with all that I put them through, but I still want to be a part of their lives. The drive in the dismal conditions to their mother's house had been uneventful. When I pulled in, I could see that Roger's car was in the driveway, my ex-wife's boyfriend. Normally when I pick up the kids, I go in and at least say hello, but... Today I decided with the rain and with Roger there, that I would be okay without talking to the ex. Both children exited the vehicle and said thank you for the ride, which, which I appreciated. I began my drive home in the now darkening twilight, the rain coming down much heavier than before. I made sure to drive carefully as I couldn't remember the last time I had replaced the tires. I'm sure the traction wasn't great. I pulled into my home and fired up the workstation again. This would take a few minutes as I used multiple devices. As that was warming up, I threw some food into the microwave and put on a show. I grabbed a cold beer from the fridge and began my lonesome meal in front of my TV. I finished up my meal and made my way back to the workstation and set up the conditions to my liking. I checked my emails first thing to see what updates I had. This normally notified me of my cryptocurrency or any other updates that I had, but there remained that mysterious email titled, The Real Truth. Being a hacker and a programmer, I knew better than to click on something that had no return address. However, whether it was due to a mouse slip or perhaps just me having one too many beers for dinner, I found myself clicking on the email. The email didn't contain many words other than the subject heading on the pictures. There were many pictures, most of which seemed to be in people in hazmat suits, cleaning up random scenes in laboratories. Other images contained very graphic scenes of mutilated people. These images were quite disturbing, even for someone like me. Despite the complete chaos from the horrific images, it appeared that these victims, for lack of a better word, were arranged in a way that confused me. 
It was as if some demented modern artist had carefully placed these corpses in a manner that almost seemed to mean something. The setting for these images slowly changed from what looked like a contained facility to now urban areas, like campsites and even remote cabins. Some pictures had titles or captions like, they don't like fire, stay in the light, and don't listen to the voices, while others had numbers associated with them which I soon found to be coordinates. I opened another tab on my desktop and entered the coordinates in a secure browser on Tor. There was no reason for this level of security, but I was always someone to err on the side of caution. At first, these coordinates didn't seem to pull up any significant locations. Most of these locations seemed to be on private land, out in the middle of nowhere. However, I was able to find that one of these areas was connected to a highway system and was definitely accessible to the public. As I looked into this more, I soon realized that it appeared that the government was trying to cover this up. It would appear that there was some kind of creature inhabiting these wood areas. I would even dare to say with all the pictures of the facilities that the government at one point had captured one of them. However, it's hard to tell considering that the pictures weren't very clear. And other than the pictures, I wasn't given much information. With everything that I'd been given, I decided to package all of this up into a nice email which I sent anonymously to the city's news station. I tried searching on the dark web and even reverse Google image searched the pictures, but I couldn't find anything. These pictures appeared to be original. In the past, having leaked information to various news outlets, only two times have anyone actually responded. The two times were from the same reporter named Rebecca Johnson of Channel 5 News. She was young but aggressive in her reporting. There was a time in which she actually used one of my leaks to catch the mayor having an affair with his secretary. She was obviously a choice for me to send this information to, seeing how she actually used my leaks and how she was a go-getter. I was actually excited to see what she'd come up with with all the information that I gave her. I was rather curious about what was going on, more so who had sent the email to me and why. But also, I was also intrigued to see what Rebecca would come up with. After a week of leaking this information to Rebecca, I got a response saying that she was able to uncover that the coordinates led deep inside a national park that was actually roped off with police tape. She tried to get more access, but the rangers there stopped her, saying that they were working on construction for a new road going through the park, and that no one from the public was allowed inside. She mentioned in her email that it wasn't construction tape or signs, but rather, actual police tape and biochemical signs. She said that she knew that they were hiding something, but, but just didn't know what. She was allowed to wander the rest of the park and even camp if she wanted to, but obviously she was only interested in what they were hiding. I didn't think much of the email and I didn't even think to respond considering it didn't confirm nor deny anything, but it didn't make me wonder who had sent me the email with those pictures. The person had clearly had access to what was going on. I went out of town that upcoming weekend to go visit a friend when I got a call from my ex-wife. I stared at the phone as it rang in my hand. I told her to only call me if it was an emergency. However, she called me before for said emergencies and it happened to be just something dramatic at work and unrelated to me. It made me kinda happy that she still wanted to talk to me, but it also made me upset, considering our past. I decided not to answer the phone and let it go to voicemail. While out of town, I briefly continued my investigation, and I reevaluated my email on my personal laptop. I considered posting on the dark web to see if anyone else had any more information on the subject, but seeing how this could be a threatening situation if I was found probing, I decided to keep all this information to myself and not to post it online. Rebecca Johnson was the only person I trusted with this subject. The weekend went by quickly and I checked my personal email to see what updates I had, and it looked like Rebecca had emailed me about 10 times. Each email was an update on the development of the story and what she uncovered. The first couple of emails had images of various campsites that looked to be roped off by caution tape, however the photos seemed to be taken at night. The crime scenes didn't reveal much at first other than torn tents and a few abandoned camping trailers. 
However, things begin to get weirder as the photos then begin to show images of just the woods. She added in with a few photos how she felt at night and that she kept hearing random screams in the distance. It was as if Rebecca was randomly taking photos at night with her flash on, as if she was using the flash to illuminate her way through the woods. That is, until I saw one photo that seemed to really bother me. I saw what appeared to be a person, however the distance and the poor lighting couldn't identify whether it was male or female, but I could see that whoever it was wasn't wearing any clothing. There appeared to be a black stain around the neck area. That was an obvious sign for concern, but there was no information given on this photo. The last photo of the email showed a large and rather ominous looking tunnel that looked to go inside the side of a mountain. Rebecca added to the last email how she had seen multiple military vehicles enter this tunnel and that she felt that there were answers to be found inside. The last email was sent Sunday morning at 2.57 a.m. The emails from Rebecca had abruptly stopped and I would go a whole week without hearing from her. All I could really do, other than going down to the location I had sent her, was to wait for more updates. Things got interesting three days later when I got another anonymous email without a return address. There had been a handful of times where I had felt completely terrified and helpless. Little did I know that. That email I was about to open would completely shatter any past experiences and scare me to a level I had never felt. The email was simple, but it scared me psychologically. There were photos of Rebecca tied down in some kind of lab with some type of creature next to her. That was the only photo that I could recognize Rebecca in. The rest of the photos were blurry, yet I was able to make out parts of the images having blood and flesh tossed carelessly around the lab. The subject heading for the email simply put, Stop. Looking. I stood up from my chair, as it was obvious that whoever sent me the initial email was not the same person that sent me this one. The first email felt like an invitation to further understand the evils taking place at this facility, while this most recent email was definitely a threat. I received another email almost immediately after this one, which was equally as disturbing. Rather than my information being listed, it was my ex-wife and my children, their names, addresses, places of occupation, and etc. However, there was a slight mix-up with this information. They called me Richard, who was obviously my ex-wife's current boyfriend. Apparently, when they tried to dox me, they looked at my old IP address, not my new one. It now looked like Richard was now on the hook for what I had been investigating. At first, I saw this as being rather fortuitous, since they had the wrong man, but it also scared me that my ex-wife and children were now involved. I still loved them, even though I was no longer a reliable role model for them and only saw them seldomly. I immediately tried calling my wife to which it rang a few times until it went to voicemail. I called her three more times to the same effect. I even tried calling both my children, but no answer. It was clear that what had happened and I couldn't just sit on the sidelines in this situation, but rather try my best to somehow recover them. I drove by their house to see if they were there. Both my wife and her boyfriend's car were there. I tried knocking on the door, but no answer. At this point, I had to assume the worst. At this point, I finally decided that I had to investigate myself. When I was in the NSA, I was required to take a firearms training, which was some time ago. I still had various weapons from the time working there, including some black market weapons as well. I still had my old body armor from the training, but that was definitely out of date since I got the armor about 10 years ago. I went back to my house and loaded up the Camry with my weapons and ammo while wearing my body armor. I plugged in the coordinates that I'd sent to Rebecca and started driving to the National Park where all of this was taking place. The National Park was about 6 hours away, which would mean that I would arrive at the park in the cover of night. This actually worked out well considering my plan was to park at the campsite and hike my way down to the tunnel. My six hour drive was filled with fear and anxiety, not necessarily for myself but rather my family. I felt like my life was in between the states of not caring and oblivion, 
I had no real meaning for something until now. I must save them. After the long drive, I finally arrived at the National Park around 9 at night. This was due to having to stop a couple of times to fuel up and multiple attempts to still contact any family members. The front gates to the park were abandoned. There were no personnel there, which was good and bad. I drove into the park and was surprised by the thick layer of fog that covered the trees around me. It made visibility incredibly low. I exited my car with my machine gun around my shoulder. I stayed on the main paved path that led deep into the park, half expecting for rangers to come and stop me, but no one ever did. However, my feeling of anxiety and fear began to multiply as I heard what sounded like gunfire coming a good distance away in front of me. I pressed on in hopes that I could step off the path and hide if things got out of hand. After a solid 30 minutes of hiking and hearing gunfire, I then was able to see light coming from what looked like a couple of industrial trailers, much like the ones you see at mining operations, or any remotely located company. I stayed my distance as I didn't want to get involved. I was unsure who was firing at what and I felt that regardless of who found me, I was good as dead. I had to remain unseen whether by the creatures or by the rangers. I crept up on the slight hill overlooking the trailers and saw that there was quite the battle going on, but the rangers were clearly outnumbered. There only seemed to be one trailer actively firing at the beasts trying to come inside. My help from the hillside would prove to be useless as I could tell that the standard ammo that they were using was not that effective. When all hope seemed to be lost and by some miracle, a small group of rangers somehow made it out of the trailer and into a cargo van. The cargo van was able to pull out of the area and onto the highway that ran down the middle of the national park. All the creatures that were trying to enter the trailer had now began to follow the cargo van and leaving the area. This was my way in, I thought. I need to go down there and investigate the area and see if just maybe they left behind any type of gear that would be helpful. I left the little comfort that the shadows and the solitude that that hill had and entered what felt like a war zone. There were small fires scattered across the area that looked to be what remained of some unlucky creatures. I scanned the area for any sign of life, but there seemed to be none. In that area, there appeared to be several different dressed people. One said I was able to recognize as four strangers, while others were dressed in hazmat suits. I wasn't sure what the hazmat people's role were in the area. Perhaps there was some kind of disease or hazardous material in the area. There was an abundance of material left behind, which I took advantage of and replaced my gear with. I was now wearing proper body armor and I even found a spare hazmat suit that I instinctively put on. This was to protect myself but also to conceal my identity if I were to encounter anyone that was still alive. The area had a few cargo vans that still seemed to be in working order. I just needed to find the keys. I checked inside and whether by poor maintenance or by sheer chaos, the keys were still in the ignition. I quickly jumped in and started the cargo van. This seemed to have alerted something to my presence. As the cargo van fired up, I began to hear screaming, coming not too far away. Most likely in one of those trailers I purposely avoided. I didn't stay to see what came out, but rather took off the same road that the other cargo van took in hopes to find the tunnel of some kind. That's all I had to go off of. I drove the cargo van not too far when I saw what appeared to be a crash. It was the same cargo van I just saw leave and there were some creatures surrounding it. The creatures appeared to be some kind of hybrid human wolf thing. They stood upright and had normal limbs of a person, however their features were off. I didn't get a great look at them since my instincts told me to hit them with the van. I veered the van in their direction in which I sent a handful of the creatures flying. I kept going forward when I finally arrived at what appeared to be the same tunnel that Rebecca had shown me in her emails. I drove into the tunnel slowly. The tunnel was not illuminated in any way and I had to go off of the headlights of the van. I didn't get too far into the tunnel when I saw what looked to be two people fighting. One looked like a ranger fighting on the ground with what looked like another ranger on top, but something was off. I noticed that the person on top was bleeding profusely, but the blood looked to be black. 
I kept the cargo van aligned with the scuffle in front of me. While exiting, I remembered that those creatures didn't like fire. A brief search in the rear of the cargo van revealed a flamethrower alongside other materials like flares, medical supplies, and etc. I grabbed the flamethrower and a flare and ignited the flare and tossed it in the direction of the fighting. I approached the two people and threatened both with the flamethrower if they didn't stop. The person on top didn't seem to care that I was even there and kept screeching like those creatures I saw earlier. Seeing clearly that the person on top was one of them, I ignited the creature with the flamethrower. Not having ever used the flamethrower before, I ignited both people on accident. The creature on top jumped up and ran down the tunnel while changing its form from a person to this ungodly creature before collapsing. The person on bottom I accidentally lit on fire only had part of themselves ignited which made it easy for me to quickly put out. The person I was helping screamed but it sounded more natural, well, as natural as a person being on fire. After about 10 seconds, the fire went out, and the person seemed to only sustain small burns. Thank you, said the ranger, to which I nodded. My name is Andrew. We need to get out of here, he said exhaustedly. Hello, Andrew, I responded. I agree. However, I am looking for answers. I think that those creatures in this tunnel are somehow connected. I don't know for sure, but I think the people in charge of this place have my family. Andrew stared at me with wide eyes. Do you know anything about this place, or can you assist me in any way? I asked sincerely. Andrew took a minute before hesitantly nodding. I don't know anything about this place, but I am willing to help you since you saved me. I let out a sigh of relief and helped Andrew up. His arms and part of his torso were burned, but after a quick bandaging of gauze, he seemed to be okay. Andrew and I both hopped in the van and continued down the tunnel. We came across small embers of the creature I had just recently ignited not too long ago. The creature was lifeless and a small amount of smoke continued to come from the lifeless corpse. We pressed on not too further when we saw something that surprised us. In the middle of the tunnel wasn't some kind of horrific monster or hive of creatures, but rather a military grade tank next to a large door. The tank illuminated the tunnel with a spotlight we could hear as we approached people speaking to us over a megaphone. They instructed us to go to the decontamination area up ahead for inspection. We both looked at each other as we were confused. I slowly drove forward and followed the instructions. Upon exiting, we were swarmed with more people in hazmat suits, which, which tackled poor Andrew to the ground. I was still wearing my hazmat suit, and they seemed to ignore me. It was pretty clear that the ranger was not authorized to be in this area of the park. They apprehended Andrew and placed him on a stretcher and cuffed him to it. He looked at me with confusion, but I couldn't break my cover. They pushed Andrew inside and I followed inconspicuously, as if I were to be one of them. Things began to get weirder. Upon entering the facility, I was astonished to see inside was some kind of horrific lab. It wasn't a military base, but rather some kind of research center. And the surprises only got worse when I saw various types of people. Some were in hazmat suits, while others were in white lab coats. They even had heavy security, wearing military-grade armor. But alongside those people were what I can only describe to be as greys. Greys are a type of alien race that, for one, are grey, but also a type of alien that is often depicted for human abduction. I had seen files of them before on the dark web of greys walking amongst the human population, but I had no idea that they were working with us. I tried to act natural in this setting, but it was difficult. I needed not to draw any attention to myself and to try to get some answers. I also tried to keep Andrew safe, but I had no loyalty to him. I needed to find my family. I figured, wherever they're going to take him, there would also be my family. I tried to remain calm while following where they were taking Andrew. However, I didn't get too far when a gray, for whatever reason, began to point at me. I didn't have time to react as my body began to be paralyzed by some kind of force. I fell to the ground as a man in a suit walked over to me while slowly clapping. Bravo, Zack. I didn't think you'd get this far. I couldn't move, but I was aware of everything that was going on. The Grey seemed to be using some kind of paralyzing force, causing me to not move. The man in the suit knelt down next to me, and I could see his security badge with his last name. 
Worski. You know, Zack, someone like you with your kind of skills can never really retire, especially after what you know. I'm quite disappointed that you got Rebecca involved. She was close. You're probably wondering what we're doing here, why we created those things. Well, it comes down to this, Zack. The world is no longer ours. Us humans have lost the battle to the Greys, and we, a select few people in the government, are in charge of reducing the population. The Greys are sophisticated. They don't want to reduce our resources with fighting or war, but rather a more casual takeover. A takeover that doesn't destroy the world that they're trying to capture. We figured the best way to do that is to release the perfect weapon, which we find to be skinwalkers. Funny enough, the Greys have a similar monster on their planet. Well, I suppose their monster is a little more complicated. Anyways, I don't know why I'm telling you all this. The security detail picked me up and placed me on a stretcher while cuffing me to it. Borsky walked over and patted my chest. Oh, and uh, don't worry about your family. It won't matter soon anyways. You know, Zach, I'm really glad you got my email. I am the town sheriff. A couple of weeks ago, I was informed by the FBI that there will be a family moving into my town that would be a part of the witness protection program. I wasn't given much detail other than I had to help check in on this family every other day or so, whether it was by driving by or texting one of the parents daily. I was told that they had some involvement with organized crime, whether it was with gangs or mafia. I'm not quite sure. I did notice on one of my early morning patrols of that family that the family had a daughter who seemed to be young and unassuming of the true horrors that the world had to offer. She was standing outside waiting for the school bus as I drove by. At this point, I had never seen her with any other children. I just assumed that she was an only child. The family was assigned to live on the more outskirts part of the town that nestled up to a thick forest that ended our town boundaries. Having grown up in this town, I had heard stories of some ancient evil living in those woods, but growing up I was always skeptical. I was friends with the game warden and he told me other than the occasional stray pack of wolves or the drugged out homeless people that would sometimes live out there, there was nothing really to be afraid of. However, it did make the housing costs for those looking to buy near the forest much cheaper. Every town has that one story that never seems to die, a story much like a festering wound that once started as something small, now causing way more damage than the initial wound. A story to cause all nearby locals to reconsider entering the woods, especially at night. In the late 70s, there was that one incident in the forest that resulted in a mass killing of cult members. I was only a child at the time, but my uncle, who was on the forest, told my dad. My father ended up telling me that about 13 people were eaten alive that were tied to trees out in those woods. At least that's what he told me one night late around a campfire. Ever since then, the people in the town claimed to hear screams coming from the woods at night, or even hearing their names being called. Apparently, if you follow the voices, then something is supposed to come and get you, but that's something I never did believe. Nonetheless, all the statements were something I could never verify nor confirm for myself. They were all secondhand stories that I've heard from other people. Seeing how the witness protection family had no idea about the dark history, it always seemed wrong that I couldn't technically inform them of what they were living next to. However, thankfully for them, they were taking the identity of corn farmers and had a good bit of cornfields as a buffer between them and the forest. They weren't actually farmers, so they would have no business being out in those fields anyways. For whatever reason, the family seemed to be rather important to the FBI. I was given access to their security system that linked into my phone. It was supposed to be faster than calling 911. One day, seemingly out of the blue, the father of the family came by the station to inform me that he and his wife will be leaving town for the weekend and wanted me to keep an eye on his daughter. Seeing how he was genuinely concerned, I informed him that I was already keeping a soft patrol on his family, but I could definitely beef things up for him since that there will be no parents at the house. I think it was out of my place to ask, but I did it anyways. Have you or your family had any issues living near those woods? I know the cornfields are much closer, but do you ever hear anything at night? 
The father looked surprised, and he told me that he and his wife hadn't really noticed anything. And his daughter, well, she was deaf. I don't know if you know this, but the folklore of this town is that there's something in those woods next to those cornfields. They try to call out to people. If you listen to the voices, then something is supposed to come and get you. The father gave me a light and white smile. I could tell he thought less of me for believing in something as crazy as a creature calling out to you, but that was something everyone in this town believed. I just thought to get him on the same page. Well, what kind of creature is it supposed to be? He asked, almost mockingly. I shook my head and pulled out a pad and pen and wrote down the word, seeing that I didn't want to say it out loud. He read it and laughed even more. Really? Okay, well, I guess I won't say it out loud then. I think the look on my face convinced him that there must have been something terrible to have happened for me not wanting to say this simple word. We chatted for a few more minutes and he laughed. The simple conversation nearly evaporated as I went throughout my day of normal policing. One of my deputies got very sick that week and had to call out. I had to cover his area and totally forgot to assign someone to watch over the witness protection family. I didn't realize the blunder I made until it was too late. It was nighttime and I got a strange notification on my cell phone which I'd never gotten before. It was as if someone was calling me but when I looked down at my phone, my entire screen was red. It showed an address which I immediately knew to be the witness protection family. The security system had automatically called the father who I'd spoken to only a few days prior. He answered immediately and seemed to have gotten the same notification I did. He sounded panicked. I told him that his daughter needed to immediately hide until we got there, but as I said this, he told me that he could see on his cell phone that there was already someone inside the house. I told him to call his daughter and to tell her to run into the field next to the forest. If it was a local intruder, they would know better than to follow her so close to the forest that late at night. If it wasn't a local, then let's just hope that the cornfield provides enough cover until I get there. He agreed and hung up the phone and I sped off to their address. I was the second to the scene since their distant neighbor, who was asked by their parents to stop by, was already there. The front door was broken down and the living room area looked to be trashed with muddy footprints all over. I assumed those to be the intruders. The boot print trail led almost immediately to what looked like the girls' room. The window to the room was wide open. I went back to the living room and asked the neighbor if they saw anything, and he said he didn't. Right then, entered a girl covered in dirt and she began shouting nonsense at us. I was so confused at what she was saying, I didn't remember what her father had told me until the farmer reminded me that she was indeed deaf. We handed her a pen and paper and she told us that there was something out in the field with her. It got the intruder. The farmer and I both looked at each other with terrified looks on our faces as we both knew the folklore of that terrible incident. After about half an hour or so, the farmer and I both were able to get the girl to calm down, and she went home with him, seeing that he was a family friend of the family. We roped off the crime scene, but didn't investigate the field until the next day, for, you know, protocol. The next morning revealed some corn stalks being destroyed, as well as random puddles of blood, and bits and pieces of torn clothes. Unfortunately, having investigated the field the next day, most of the evidence had been scavenged by birds and other small animals. I would like to say that this was the end of the story, where everything went back to normal, where the family was relocated to another town in another state, and that our town went back to normal, but that wasn't true. The family wasn't relocated, and the town definitely didn't go back to normal. If anything, it made things worse. After the incident, I became rather invested in this family. I felt as if that, by watching this family, I would be able to gain an insight to what had happened in that field. I think whatever happened in that field was clearly connected to what happened in that forest those many years ago when I was a child. The family was not able to move quite yet for whatever reason, but we beefed up surveillance until the FBI was able to find another place and another identity. I kept an eye on the family personally through the security system that let me look inside the family's home. Personally, it felt a bit invasive, but those were my orders. A couple of weeks later, I got a notification one night. It was the same kind of notification as the time before when the girl was home alone. 
However, this time, both parents were there. It was about two in the morning, and the home was dark. I saw on my phone that a figure had entered the residence from the back door, facing the field, and stood there. I got out of bed quickly, got dressed in normal clothes, and sped off to the address that I now knew by heart. It didn't take me long to reach the address, and thankfully, there was another squad car there out front. I rushed inside, seeing that the front door was opened, and there stood the wife speaking to the officer, who was taking notes. The father was nowhere to be seen, and I was told upon arriving that the girl was still asleep. The mother was speaking to the officer on the scene, and I walked around the home to see what was going on. Apparently, someone had entered the home from the back door, and the father went to investigate while armed with a firearm. The mother didn't hear a struggle, or any discharge of any kind of firearm. She only came out to open the door for the officer when he arrived. The back door was still open, and there were muddy footprints that walked around the home. The footprints did not look normal. That's the only way I can really describe it. The footprints definitely looked human in some way, but... They were not wearing shoes of any kind, which was clearly odd. I walked outside the back door and looked towards the field, and even the force that laid behind it. I stared for longer than I realized. What snapped me out of my trance was a surprising discovery. I could see barely with the aid of my flashlight, a figure just standing in the inside of the cornfield, back towards me. The sight frightened me, however I quickly called out, and the figure was responsive. After a brisk walk down to the cornfield, I saw that it was the father of the family. He walked up to me with wide eyes and a look of disbelief. He was much different than the skeptical man I spoke to only weeks prior. What do we know about this thing? He asked sternly. Not much. We just stay away from this area, if I'm being completely honest. I responded. I could tell that whatever just occurred had changed this man from being an unbeliever even a critic of some beliefs to someone who was just face to face with some terrible type of evil. We finally both walked inside, and I offered to stay the night watching the forest from my car, but they declined. We locked up the back door and the other officer and I ended up leaving not much later. Things began to get weird after that. The father of the family, let's call him Jeff, became oddly obsessed with the forest just beyond the cornfield. He would text me just about every other day or so with updates with new information he found online. He told me he thinks it could be a number of things. He thinks it might be a demon that the cult had summoned and now haunts the woods. He texted me another day thinking it was something that didn't even exist in this dimension. I shared with him what we all thought the creature was, and I didn't say the name for obvious reasons. But he thought differently. He then began sending pictures of different things he would find. Some were from his house, while others were out in the field. Jeff was clearly not afraid of the forest, but rather fixated on what lived out there. Out of nowhere, the texts and phone calls from Jeff abruptly stopped. I, for one, figured he finally got over what was going on and had moved on. I kept watch from my smartphone on the security system to see how things were going. The mother and daughter seemed to be living a somewhat normal life, however Jeff was acting very strange. I would notice he would sometimes stand in places for a very long time, sometimes facing a window while other times just standing in a corner. I just thought that Jeff was going through a hard time in his life in a weird way. Although Jeff was acting weird, I wasn't concerned. It wasn't until a couple of days later I noticed I hadn't seen the mother in any of the security footage. I figured I was due for an in-person wellness check, so I drove to the home late one Saturday afternoon. Lisa, the daughter, answered the door after I rang the doorbell which alerted the system that flashed lights to notify her. This time I remembered that she was deaf and brought a pen and paper just for her. Lisa was kind enough to speak to me, although that she couldn't hear, she could definitely read lips. She told me that she could understand as long as she could see what I was saying. Oh, neat. I didn't know that. Hey, is uh, your mother home by chance? I asked. Lisa shook her head and gave me a small frown. Do you know where she is? Lisa gave me another head shake and a bigger frown. Where's your father? I asked. She waved her hand to follow her inside and led me to the living room. Standing in the living room stood Jeff, but he was facing a corner and just stood there. I had seen this on the security footage, but something about seeing this in real life really scared me. It was as if Jeff had no idea I was even there. 
I looked back at Lisa and she told me that something was wrong. She told me that she felt something coming from the floor which she had never felt before, a couple days ago. I didn't understand what she was trying to say. You felt something on the floor? I was confused. She then explained to me that she thinks there's something in the basement hitting the floor above. Oh, where's your basement? I asked. She guided me over to a door that was heavily locked. She told me that about a week ago, her father had placed these locks on the door and she hadn't been able to go down there. I glanced over to the living room and saw that Jeff had not moved. He was clearly not doing well. I went out to the garage and found a hammer and smashed the few exterior locks that covered the door. I told Lisa to follow me into the basement because I didn't want her to be alone upstairs with her dad like this. Once I opened the door, I clearly alerted something that laid waiting in the dark basement below. I had to switch to the lights, but nothing turned on. Of course, I said to myself. I pulled out my gun and my flashlight and started walking down the stairs. Lisa followed me and as we went down the stairs, I began to hear muffled sounds coming from deeper in the basement. I reached the bottom of the stairs and shined my light around. I kept Lisa behind me and she wisely gripped tightly onto the hammer that I used to break the locks on the basement door. The moans were coming from another door that had the same kind of locks as the basement door. I handed Lisa my light and traded her for the hammer. I broke the locks and grabbed my light back from Lisa. I slowly opened the door to reveal the most horrific thing I'd ever see. Inside the room were the remains of the mother, which were not much. All that remained was a head and a various amount of bones that still had chunks of meat on them. Next to the mother was Jeff, the real Jeff. Jeff was still alive, but barely. His legs and one of his arms had been removed. Jeff was chained to a support beam in the basement that had scratch marks and blood going down it. His mouth was covered with duct tape, and even before poor Lisa removed the tape, I knew that Jeff was trying to warn her this whole time by hitting the beam in desperate hopes to get her attention. I immediately called this in and went upstairs to confront whatever it was that was impersonating Jeff. By the time I got upstairs, whatever it was was gone. The back door was wide open. The report, despite my lengthy and personal testimony to what actually happened, according to the FBI, that the Mafia had finally gotten a hold of the family. My police station was held somewhat responsible for not providing adequate protection, but the courts ruled in our favor that the FBI failed to relocate them fast enough. My station as well as the entire town caught wind of the entire story and now refuse to have anything to do with those woods. The farmers that would once plant crops in the field have refused to utilize it anymore. I don't blame them. As for me, I'm just waiting. I know that these first couple of events will be the first of many. I think after this first incident, the creature became somehow hungrier. I think it's up to me to somehow find a way to put a stop to it. After the events of the Witness Protection family, or should I say what was left of the family, things became more difficult for me. The creature imitating the father was still on the loose, but word was slowly starting to spread. My main priority was to find this creature before anyone else fell victim, or before it became common knowledge that something lurked just on the outskirts of town. I had to make a difficult decision. I needed to eradicate this evil and fast. I then proposed to the rest of the sheriff's department that we needed to take this head on before things got worse for the town. If we waited and let this evil come to us, then it'd be too late. At first, I asked for volunteers to come with me and come the cornfield, and then the woods. Naturally, the entire department had declined to get involved with my proposal. However, I then held a small meeting with the department sharing with them my alternative if no one volunteered. I obviously couldn't force them into following me into that field, but I also needed help. I told the department to meet me after work for a mandatory meeting. One of the perks of being the sheriff is that people tend to listen to you when you ask them. The meeting started and I think the department knew where I was going with this. I sat up front on one of the desks and just folded my arms. Most of the department had either been initially involved or knew enough about the witness protection family case to not to want to be personally involved any further. 
I started the meeting bluntly and told them the truth. Look guys, I either get four volunteers or I have to open this up to the public, I said as a convincing bluff. There was no way I was going to actually do that and open it to the public, but I was desperate for help. I waited a few seconds and thankfully my bluff worked and I was able to get the three of the four volunteers I asked for. That was one shy of what I wanted, but I was willing to make do. Thank you for volunteering, I said almost sarcastically. The rest of the meeting we went over my plan. I was going to hunt down this creature before anything else had happened in this town. Preferably before anyone else knew what was happening out in that cornfield. My plan was simple, comb the field, make it secure, and then search the woods for the creature. The witness protection family had since been relocated, so the home would be our base of operation. The meeting ended and the next day we would start our hunt for the creature. Those that didn't volunteer would have to work a bit short-handed in town, but nothing ever happened in this small town, so they'd be fine. Those of us willing to brace the unknown out in that field arrived at the witness protection family's home the next morning, in a sobering realization. Even myself upon arriving considered calling off the search due to the sheer eeriness that that home emitted. A sense of evil had left its filthy stain behind, whether physically at the home or mentally with those involved. I for one knew what we were getting into, or at least I thought I did. Those that volunteered, I am sure felt the same way. The old brick home still had the police tape lightly covering the perimeter, as well as some of the doors and windows, making the home look like a Halloween prop at a haunted house attraction. I removed the tape on the front door and began bringing in bags of equipment. The equipment I brought in were a couple of laptops that we used to tap into the already installed security system that this family had. Aside from the laptops, I also brought in weapons for us to use on the creature. The weapons were slightly outdated, but worked all the same. The three volunteers that came with me were all deputies that I was actually pretty good friends with. Roger was my closest friend and a skilled hunter. He was one of those guys that would take a week off to go hunt bears up in Alaska. I think he primarily used a bow when he hunted, but thankfully he left the bow at home. The other two deputies, Stephen and Bryson, were good guys from my church that I had known for some time. Stephen also happened to be the husband of my wife's best friend. Bryson was an odd duck. He was a couple years older than I was and would often butt heads with me more than anyone else, but he was a good guy. I think he mentioned that he had a rough time when he was younger with the law, but left that all behind him when he was born again. I obviously did a background check on him before making him a deputy, but nothing came back that made me think otherwise. Nonetheless, despite being slightly short-handed, I felt like this crew was the one to get things done. We brought with us a set of walkie-talkies as well as a police radio to communicate with the officers that stayed back at the department. We spent the morning getting set up in the security system. This surprisingly took us some time. The home was obviously empty, but that event that cursed this home still seemed to provide a dull glow of remembrance. The team, including myself, didn't seem to want to do anything alone. We made sure to pair off when we did do anything that could potentially cause us to be separated for any amount of time. While it was still daytime, we made sure to comb the cornfield for any signs of that creature. We made sure to do this before lunch so that we wouldn't be too full or too sleepy. I know how these guys operate. Promise them food afterwards and they'll do the hard task. If not, then it won't get done. To be fair, I did fall into this category as well. We walked out to the cornfield that looked much more withered than before. It was clear that the farmer that used to take care of this field had no longer been providing care. It was as if the farmer knew better than to step out into that field. The stalks were tall but provided much less resistance and fell over quite easily when pushed. We made sure to walk in a line practically shoulder to shoulder so that for one we wouldn't miss anything but also to make sure that we wouldn't get separated. It didn't take us long to find where that one intruder had been killed. The forensic team had done a pretty good job cleaning up, or should I say gathering what remained of the evidence, but there were still some brown spots on where the stalks had been knocked over. The area was a significant clearing that looked like whatever got the intruder had thrown him a couple of times. We didn't stay long as we were trying to get through this field as quickly as possible, since we were all hungry. 
We pressed on for 15 more minutes before we were all overcome with this intense smell of metal. Burning metal, to be exact. My first instinct was that there was a tractor that had broken down out in this field. However, the smell seemed to take on a different form that was unlike anything I'd ever smelled before. We all looked at each other and stopped in the middle of the field. We were all armed, but didn't have anything drawn until now. I pulled out my custom AR that wasn't police issued off my shoulder while everyone else did the same. It was noontime, so the visibility was clear, but it didn't matter. The corn obstructed our views that were more than five feet in front of us, so we were all at a disadvantage. Instead of relying on sight, we followed that horrendous smell. We knew that whatever was on the other end of it was something that we didn't really want to see. About 30 seconds later, we stumbled across what I can describe was what remained of a person that had gotten hit by a train. Parts were everywhere. Limbs were detached, but were accounted for nearby. The head was missing, but we could surmise that with the clothing of what this person was wearing, they were either homeless or a drifter from another town. No one from this town would ever come close to this field in fear of ending up as this person did. The blood covered the area was now black, but the body was slightly warm and still soft. This meant although the body wasn't a fresh kill, it was somewhat rather recent though. It's a good thing we haven't had lunch yet, Bryson said while gagging. The smell was intense, so we didn't stay long. We tried to radio in what we saw, but the radios only worked so far from the station. We tried looking for tracks, but the matted corn stalks prevented any real tracks we could ever follow. However, Roger saw something with his hunter's eyes. A small trail of blood could be seen heading in a certain direction, which eventually led us out of the cornfield and into the adjacent woods. It didn't take long for the blood trail to lead us to a decapitated head of a man that was impaled on a tree branch leading into the forest. His face was twisted with horror, and his mouth was wide as if he had died, screaming. Okay then, I said. Uh, yeah, we're gonna take a lunch before we go in there, I said to the group. They all agreed and let out a sigh of relief. The walk back through the cornfield was much quicker this time. Whether it was because of the prospect of food hung in the air or we still felt vulnerable, we made sure to leave a clear path that would lead us back to the head after lunch so we could investigate more. Before we got lunch, we obviously called in the body, and the coroner came out and picked it up. At this point, we were certainly starving. I offered barbecue for lunch, but everyone got nauseous at the thought of pure meat after seeing the body of that one man. We eventually landed on pizza and had Steven go pick it up in town. Steven sat his gun down on the kitchen counter and went out the back door and around the house to one of the police cruisers. We waited for Steven to get back and we sat around the house just goofing around on our phones. About 30 minutes later while we were waiting, we heard a single bang on the back door. We did order three pizzas for four people, so Steven had his hands full. He was probably struggling to open the door while holding all the pizzas. I motioned for Bryson to open the door and he begrudgingly got up to help. When he opened the door, he didn't move. Instead of Steven walking in with the pizzas, Bryson walked out the door and bent down. He yelled for all of us to come over in a panicked voice. I could see on the open door a smudge of blood dripping downwards. I glanced over to Bryson to see that he was crouched down to the very same decapitated head that we'd seen out in the woods. Something had thrown that head at the door. What are we dealing with? Roger said. We all glanced at the cornfield and knew that this evil had been watching us all day. Stephen arrived a few minutes later and we were all still outside looking at the cornfield. He walked up to us not noticing the head until he was practically on top of it. Once he noticed it, his reaction was much like Bryson's, panicked and vulnerable. All right, let's get back inside. The rest of the day, we were on high alert as we watched out the windows and prepped for another plan to get rid of this unwanted creature. We brainstormed different ideas such as hunting this thing at night, getting a posse from the town, and even using live bait. Roger thought of baiting a trap, but other than people, I had no idea what this creature ate. How would we bait it? 
Another suggestion we considered was to simply not allow people to come to this side of the town. People already knew not to come over here, but if we blocked the only road coming in, then perhaps that would be enough to starve this creature out. But then the creature would only make its way into our town. We need to kill this thing, and fast. We figured that this creature had some kind of den of iniquity in which it would sleep. Most, if not all living things, need to sleep at some point, right? Our best bet was obviously the woods, since it could actually make a structure out there. The cornfield was just its kill box. If we could make it through the cornfield and into the woods, then we could bait its den or something. We decided as a backup measure that we would gas the cornfield and, if we had the chance to trap it out there, we would then set the cornfield on fire. Night eventually came, and we had just finished putting gasoline on the perimeter of the entire cornfield. This way it would hopefully act as a wall of fire and keep the creature inside to die. We debated on whether to hunt this thing at night. I thought that, regardless of the time of day, that we were going to be at a disadvantage, so why not utilize a good portion of the day? I figured this thing would probably need to sleep. We waited until midnight just to make sure that this thing had enough time to sleep. There was a chance that this thing could be nocturnal, but if we stuck together then, we'd have a good chance of at least getting back to safety. Midnight struck and it was a moonless night. Normally the beautiful countryside would be illuminated with flecks of celestial light. However, it felt as if the heavens themselves were closed by clouds. The sky was pitch black and made our endeavor all the more terrifying. The only comfort that we were given came from one another and from our weapons that we carried. The first part of the hunt was crucial. We needed to maintain stealth until we cleared the high crops in which we believed it hunted. Once out of the cornfield, we should be okay. To make sure that we maintained maximum stealth, I told the group, no flashlights. We began our hunt and entered the sea of crops that made the already thick darkness all the more smothering. Alongside the lack of light, there also appeared to be silence. No crickets chirped. No distant dog barking off in the distance. No random cars driving down the desolate road that led to the cornfield. Just nothing. As we marched through the cornfield, I made sure to keep accounts of all the sounds that we were making. Every few minutes, I would make sure to stop the group. I would do this to try to catch any sounds that were not made by us. It was hard to hear as we all marched in the noisy crops, practically drowning out everything else. I halted us and we all stopped. We waited to hear anything, but luckily nothing followed. I did this a couple of times and the first four times, nothing made a sound. However, the fifth time that we halted, Instead of complete silence, we heard the sound of nearby crops moving, only for a few seconds. We all pointed our weapons in that direction. It's here, said Roger in a whisper. Bryson, being a hothead, pulled out a Zippo lighter and flicked it on. I shouted in a whispered tone, Stop, 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 stop! We don't know if that's the creature. And we're also still inside the cornfield. Don't do it. Bryson looked determined as he was terrified and also wanted to be the one to kill the creature. He clearly wasn't thinking effectively. Everyone agreed with me and tried to stop Bryson. Bryson, you need to listen to me. We need to make our way out of the field first, and then we'll talk. Bryson hesitated, but finally flicked off his lighter. All the elements of stealth that we tried to maintain so hard were slowly being diminished by the second with this guy. Only a couple more hundred yards and we'll be out of the cornfield. At that moment, our fears were confirmed and the creature screeched very loudly, causing all of us to panic and run into different directions. A few seconds later, I finally cleared the field and began looking for others. I found Roger and Bryson, but Stephen was nowhere to be found. Oh no. Roger was about to go back inside, but I had to stop him. Let's wait. We don't know where he is. As I was talking to Roger, Bryson pulled out his lighter again. Well, you can't do that now. Steven's still inside. No, the thing will be trapped and Steven is probably dead anyways, said Bryson. Bryson bent down to light the field and I pushed him back, causing him to drop his lighter, thankfully on the grass. I bent down to pick up his lighter and put it in my pocket when I looked up to see Bryson was now pointing his gun at me. You want that thing to get away, don't you? Bryson said. 
Hey, let's take it easy, Roger said behind me. Not only are you using us as bait, but you're also trying to feed us to it, aren't you? Bryson, you're scared, I understand that. But why would I do that? I responded. Before Bryson could give a response, Stephen emerged from the cornfield, causing Bryson to lose his concentration for a split second. Roger was quick and rather brutal in disarming Bryson with a quick pull of Bryson's gun and a hard punch to his face, smashing his nose. What's going on? Stephen said in shock. Why was he pointing a gun at you? I don't really know, to be honest. Right when I said that, out jumped the creature grabbing Stephen by the back of the neck and pulled him back into the cornfield. The creature moved so fast that I failed to capture a description of the creature. Roger and I were in complete shock and took us a few seconds before we started firing into the cornfield. Stephen's screams were loud and gut-wrenching. Roger and I both fired in the direction we thought that the creature had taken Stephen, not thinking about if we were to hit Stephen with any of our shots. His screams were becoming more distant. As it sounded, he was being dragged away. Roger looked at me once the screams had stopped. Do we burn it now? He asked. I nodded and lit the lighter and tossed it into the cornfield. The perimeter that we had doused with gasoline had immediately caught and began to spread around the circumference of the field, creating a tall wall of flames. I looked back to where Bryson had been laying to find that he was no longer there. I guess we will worry about him later. We waited by the field for a few minutes as it slowly began to burn inwards towards the center. It didn't take us long for us to hear the creature shrieking off in the distance. I think the creature realized that it was trapped. Well, I guess that takes care of that, Roger said, as he stood beside me watching the field burn. The shrieking continued, but we slowly began to hear a familiar sound that both brought relief, but also a realization that we didn't consider. It was the sound of a fire truck siren off in the distance. I guess we figured that we were so far away from the town and off into the countryside that we didn't even consider alarming the fire department to tell them not to put out this fire. Someone must have saw the tall flames of the fire. We can't let the fire department put it out before it kills the creature, I said to Roger. Out of desperation, we began running around the cornfield, but since the perimeter was burning, that we couldn't run through, so we had to run all the way around it. The sirens were much closer now, but we still had a great distance to run before we could make it back to the house. After 20 minutes or so, we finally arrived to where the truck was, but it was too late. A chill went down my spine, but I also began to feel sick at the gruesome sight that laid scattered next to the fire truck. The firemen not only put out a good portion of the fire, but it appeared that whatever we had trapped in the field had gotten out and killed all of them. Roger and I looked at one another with a look of grief and sorrow. We didn't say a word to one another. We just nodded as if we both had the same thought to go back out into the woods and finish off whatever this thing was. A good portion of the cornfield had yet to be extinguished, so we kept to the outside of the field again. The fire of the cornfield illuminated a good portion of the evening sky, but the corn didn't burn for long. It began to get low again, almost as if to remind us that the night was still dark and not over. We hiked into the woods using our flashlights, and I had Roger lead the way. He was searching for tracks while I covered him to make sure that the creature didn't jump us. Roger finally caught sign of some type of track. Next to the tracks were smoldering ash and debris. Roger and I looked at one another and I said, maybe the fire actually damaged the creature. We followed the trail and we could see that it led us to one of two things that were equally horrifying yet mesmerizing. First laid the dying creature with most of its skin burnt and a pinkish flesh remained. The second thing that we saw but we didn't quite understand glimmered like the waves of a dark ocean is what looked like a purple portal that spun slowly and counterclockwise. Firstly, we dealt with the creature. The creature was not human but its body greatly resembled one. The head of the creature was that of some kind of dog or coyote. Its eyes were black but still tracked us as we approached, but its wounds prevented it from being able to get up. Roger went over, stepped on its torso, and unloaded a mag into its skull. The creature was safely dead. Now our focus was on the strange fabric of reality that glowed. What do we do? asked Roger. I had never seen anything like this before. I reached my hand into the portal, and I could feel my hand dematerialize, but it wasn't painful. 
It was like entering my hand into a strong current of water that felt cold. I guess we'll check it out. If we don't like it, we can always just come back. Roger and I both readied our weapons and entered into the portal together. I expected this portal to take us to some dark land or even an extension of hell, but when we went through, a bright light met us and we finally materialized on the other side. We weren't on a different planet or in hell, but rather a lab. A lab operated by both humans and strange looking aliens. Neither the aliens or the people noticed us at first until we moved. Right then, an alarm went off and the lab lights changed from white to red. The intercom then buzzed on alerting the lab. Unauthorized personnel in the teleportation room. Notify director, Borsky. The sheriff and Roger had begun to panic. The scientists and the caged skinwalker-like creatures that lined the nearby wall began to go crazy. Having seen that they had clearly entered into some kind of experiment facility that was clearly aware of their presence, they tried to now get back through the portal and back into their own town. They then both jumped into the portal, but instead of going back to their town, they simply came out the other side, still inside the facility. They both looked at each other with looks of terror, as they realized that this portal was not going to get them out of here. They must find another way to get out. One of the large doors to the lab had opened, and four armed men dressed in matching dark body armor entered. Some of them were carrying machine guns while others had flamethrowers. Not waiting to ask them questions, Roger immediately opened fire while running behind cover. The sheriff did the same, although not as quickly. The armed men immediately returned a much higher rate of fire on the point of cover that Roger and the sheriff were hiding behind. The four men immediately took different positions and had them surrounded. You're not getting out of here. Getting shot is more preferable than what other means we can kill you by, one of the armed men said. The men started getting closer while hiding behind points of cover next to the portal. Perhaps out of sheer luck, the most unexpected thing had happened. Bryce, the deputy that had gotten separated from the sheriff and Roger, came through the portal. He was shocked as to find that he was no longer in the woods, but also in the science lab with caged skinwalkers and armed men. This provided the much needed distraction for the sheriff and Roger to open fire again, catching the armored men at a disadvantage. Roger and the sheriff opened fire at the distracted men, Roger hitting one of the men clearly in the head. The sheriff's aim wasn't as good as Roger's, but he managed to clip one of the tanks of the flamethrower, causing a stream of high-pressure flammable fluid to shoot out. The man carrying the flamethrower immediately turned it off and began to panic. The man carrying the flamethrower tried to take off one of the tanks while accidentally spraying some of his men and the caged creatures with the flammable fluid. Bryce, being equally caught off guard, opened fire but didn't hit anyone. Bryce then took cover behind the armored men. The tables had turned. The armored men knew that they were outgunned and surrounded. They wasted no time and ran out of the room while Bryce continued to fire, hitting one of them but in an area that was armored, only causing the man to flinch as he ran out. The lab door shut with a heavy locking sound and was now somewhat calm. The sheriff, Roger, and Bryce all met up together near the man that Roger had killed. Roger picked up his machine gun and started putting on his body armor when Bryce spoke to the sheriff. Hey, sorry about what happened back at that cornfield, Bryce said sheepishly. All is forgiven if we can work together and get out of here, the sheriff said. The sheriff noticed in the corner of the lab was a scientist sticking his hands up from behind cover. He must have not been able to get out before the armored men came in. Don't shoot, I can get you out of here. The sheriff, not taking any chances, still raised his gun in the direction, just in case. Out stepped an older looking man with glasses and a lab coat. I can also get your friends back, said the scientist. Friends? The sheriff said in a questioning tone. What friends? The two men looked confused. Are you not here to rescue your two friends we picked up in the national park? We are now. We're going to need all the help we can get. 
At that moment, the lights in the lab shut off, only leaving the emergency lights that glowed a dull red near the exits. On the intercom spoke what we can only assume to be one of the original armed men. We tried to kill you humanely, but now you killed one of us and will now suffer a horrible death. A loud buzz came on, and the cage doors housing the half dozen creatures slowly began to open. The creatures began to scream with delight and hunger as they were now being released to feed on the men left inside. Roger took aim and fired at one of the creatures, but the bullets only seemed to annoy it. Remembering that these creatures didn't like fire, Bryce ran over to the abandoned flamethrower that was still spewing fluid. Everyone shouted don't, but it was too late. Bryce, unaware of the leak, lit the torch and everything that the fluid had touched immediately erupted into flames. A good majority of the creatures caught fire and screamed. It didn't take long for the fuel tank to explode, killing Bryce and a few of the creatures immediately. The remaining creatures were running around the lab trying to put themselves out, but the fluid had saturated them so much that they continued to burn. One of the creatures that was only somewhat on fire began to attack Roger, but thankfully the new armor that he had just put on took most of the damage. The sheriff began shooting at the creature that was on Roger, causing it to jump off of him. The scientist beckoned the sheriff and Roger to follow him over to the main door, and he gave him cover while he put in the access code. While some of the creatures had died or were still on fire, there was about one or two of them that had managed to escape the flames. Once the access codes were entered, the heavy door began to open. Roger and the sheriff continued to provide cover as they exited the lab. The lab was still mostly on fire. The scientists tried putting the code in again, but the creatures started coming towards the exit, causing all of them to flee. The creatures exited the lab, but in different directions in the base, causing them to be scattered about. The scientists led them to a room a good distance away, but once inside, they saw that two people were restrained on metal tables. One looked like a soldier, while the other looked like a normal person. Roger and the sheriff set them both free and asked them their names. My name's Andrew, and this is Zach. Nice to meet both of you, said the sheriff. We're gonna need to get all of us to get out of here, but we're gonna need to work together. It looks like the creatures are now running around the base, so we need to be careful. Do you guys know of any way we can get out of here without coming across any more armored men or skinwalkers? Asked Roger. Everyone looked at the scientist since he knew the base the best. The scientist paused as he was thinking, but seemed skeptical. I know of one place where we won't come across any security or the creatures, but it's risky. There's an old section of the base that we gave to the Greys for experiments, but it got out of hand and they lost control of it. Roger interrupted, Greys? What are Greys? Zach chimed in, Greys are a type of alien that have been working with the government for years. Roger's eyes got wide. Are you serious? There's so much more the government isn't telling you, Zack said chuckling. The scientist continued. If we push through this section, then there should be an exit leading us back to the National Park. However, the section was closed down, the bottom level. It's rumored to have some sort of demon or something, some sort of evil from another world that we do not understand that dwells within. We have tried to recover this part of the base a number of times, but whatever we send through is never seen again. Interesting, said Roger. Is there an armory or a munitions room to better prepare ourselves for this area? Asked Andrew. There is actually one, but it's heavily guarded, as you would imagine. Plus, I don't think my access code would work on something like that. I'm only a scientist. My access code will get us into that closed-off area, but... To be honest, I'd rather deal with the men with guns or skinwalkers before I go down to the bottom level. We all looked at one another and weighed our odds. Pass through a high-tech military base with aliens and skinwalkers, or sneak through a closed-off section that everyone fears what lurks beneath. We did a quick recap on our weapons and ammo, which was nearly depleted. I think we have to risk it and sneak through, said Roger. The sheriff nodded and told the scientists to lead us to the bottom level. We left the room and checked the hallways to see that one of the sections in the hallway was covered in blood. The scientists led the small group in the opposite direction, down a dark hallway. 
While passing through the group, they saw what carnage remained of the scientists, and even few of the greys, that were not able to escape the rage of the skinwalkers. On a monitor sat a security technician and Director Borsky, watching the small group pass through the base on a security screen. How did they get in here, and where are they going, he asked. We think they came through one of the many portals we have open. Interesting. Borsky made a phone call on a landline and hung up. Okay, let's follow these guys. They're not getting out of this base, that's for sure. So, where are they going? The technician spoke almost hesitantly. Well, in terms of the security, the only area that is impregnable is technically the bottom level. It's closed off, but if they had an access code and went through the bottom level, they could get through to what's on the other side. Which, we don't know what is on the other side. The Grace may have a portal down there, or something like that. Even an access hatch leading to the outside. That's the only part of the base that we do not have explicit knowledge of the security since it's been closed off. Nothing is getting through the bottom level. I can personally assure you, Borsky said confidently. Let's help them get to the bottom level, he said with a grin. I'm interested to see where it takes them. The technician pressed some buttons and the metal heavy doors began to close on the security monitor, leading the small group directly to the base elevator. The group stopped for a moment when they saw the doors in the base close all around them, except for a few that seemed to be leading them somewhere. What's happening? yelled Andrew. Are they closing in on us? No, they're guiding us to the elevator, said the scientist. Why are they helping us? Zack looked up to the security camera and said solemnly, they want to watch. They know we can't get out, so they're pushing us to our deaths. The group made it to the base elevator and the scientist put in his access code. Look, I can't follow you down there, said the scientist. You can kill me now, I don't care, but I can't go down there. The elevator door opened, revealing an empty silver box with bright LED lights on top. The sheriff forced him in and said, Nobody's going to die. We're all going to get out of here. Even you. The old scientist began to weep uncontrollably like a frightened child, begging to be killed. What's down there? Roger whispered to himself. The small group now descended in the elevator for a couple of minutes. Each minute passing felt longer than the one before it. They must have descended a couple of hundred feet before the elevator slowed and eventually stopped. The elevator door opened, revealing the most odd setting. Instead of some high-tech futuristic lab, it was a cave-like structure. The walls and floor were primarily made out of stone. It was dark and not much was visible. It was very possible that this was underneath the mountain which resided in the National Park. All they had to do was find a way out. The only light that they had, aside from some small handheld lights brought from the Sheriff and Roger, came from the elevator. Everyone was quiet. No one said anything. The scientist was still sniffing from all the crying, but overall was mostly silent. Andrew and Roger were the first to step out. The sheriff followed behind while pushing the scientist and Zack also followed. The air was cool and had a slight fog that seemed to cover all areas of the cave. Something was off about this. What were the greys working on down here, and why was it closed? It didn't take long for them to find multiple bodies of both humans and aliens alike. Their bodies weren't just cut or sliced like they'd seen before, but they looked like they were crushed. This wasn't done by a skinwalker. It was something bigger. Borsky and the technician watched all of this on the security camera inside the elevator. It didn't provide a complete view, but they were still able to see everything that they needed to. Should I retract the elevator, sir? Director Borsky shook his head. No, I want to see what everyone's so afraid of down there. The group searched slowly around the cave for about 20 minutes or so. Things began to feel better as they realized whatever it was that everyone was afraid of must have been gone by now. There were workstations with futuristic looking tools and weapons, but no one knew how to use them. The scientists said that the weapons only worked for the greys and not the humans. Something about their hands emitted a certain type of radiation that powered the weapons. They didn't share this technology with us, obviously. Something then caught the scientist's eye. It was a lever that was on one of the walls. Next to the lever was a gray that was still holding the lever downwards, despite still being dead. 
The scientist walks over to the graze and was about to touch it before Zack said something. What are you doing? Don't do that. The scientist was in some kind of trance and didn't seem to listen, and touched the gray. The gray's hand then let go of the lever, and the lever shifted back upwards in the on position. Once the lever was upright, lights in the cave began to turn on. It illuminated more workstations and different types of alien spacecraft. In the middle of the cave laid horizontally what looked like a giant pool of purple liquid. Roger and the sheriff immediately knew that this was not a pool, but rather another, much larger teleporter, much bigger than the one that they'd used to get into the space. These portals are only one ways for human. If we go through, we can't come back, said the scientist. I think this is the mother portal. We have been theorizing about this one. It's the only portal that leads back to the world. All the other ones lead to other parts of the world. What if this doesn't lead to their home planet, but some other place? Zack asked. Anything is better than here, said the sheriff. As he was about to step into the portal, Zack stopped him. Wait, why did the Greys want this portal off so badly? What's on the other side? Andrew then picked up one of the bodies of the Greys and tossed it into the portal. Why would you do that? screamed Roger. The group watched silently at the portal to see if anything would come through, but nothing did. At least at first. After a few seconds, out came a colossus, scaly claw. The claw while being attached to some kind of arm that spanned 30 feet high and 10 feet wide, slowly came through. Whatever the creature was, it was too big for it to come entirely through the portal. Andrew screamed out of fright and it reached down and picked him up and slammed him on the ground, completely crushing him. The scientist tried picking up one of the Gray's weapons while also holding on to one of the dismembered Gray's hands on the handle. The scientist, surprisingly enough, actually got the weapon to fire three times, hitting the large claw, before the claw took notice, slamming him into the wall. The scientist was no more than a bloodstain and pulp. Roger was about to fire his weapon at the claw when Zack stopped him. Wait, he whispered. The claw was about to attack when it just stopped. I think it attacks based on sound, he whispered. The claw began to feel around the cave to find its next victim. The group of now three silently maneuvered their way over to one of the spaceships and out of reach of the claw. Roger grabbed an entire arm of a gray and brought it in with him as he slowly entered into one of the spaceships. The spaceship was surprisingly pretty basic. There was only one seat and they assumed it to be the pilots. The spaceship only had a few controls. Roger placed the arm on one of the controls and the ship lit up. The claw took notice and immediately tried to grab the larger ship. Roger hit one of the buttons and the ship began to levitate. However, it didn't take long for the claw to grab hold of the ship and pull it towards the portal. He tried spamming a few of the buttons on the dash, but there appeared to be no weapon systems on this ship. They tried to accelerate out of the grasp of the creature, but it was too strong. The claw then pulled them into the portal and everything went silent. Borsky and the technician watched in awe on the security monitor. The cave was now silent. Well, now we know what's down there. Close the elevator door and bring it back up. We need to continue our plans. Jess pulled into the news station, frustrated that she didn't have a story that she promised her producers for her Halloween segment. Jess was getting older, and running out of opportunities to become the lead anchor woman that she always dreamed of. She wasn't an ugly woman by any means, but she wore huge glasses since her prescription would no longer allow her to wear contacts, and the competition at this particular news station rivaled those at much bigger cities like LA or New York. Boise wasn't nearly that big, thus the stories that were nationwide quality were far and few between. Halloween was a pretty big deal for Idaho viewers, but nothing really jumped out at Jess to make her segment pop. Haunted corn mazes or pet costume contests had been beaten to death, and even then some. Jess needed something new, something scary, something to help her grab national headlines. If her segment was able to do that, she was for sure able to land the lead anchor woman 
and hopefully move to a bigger station and a bigger city. The team meeting for the station started a bit late, but Jess was early. She waited as her co-workers and producers entered the meeting. With jovial expressions, as most of them had already landed the job they wanted, the meeting was going to go over everyone's stories from the upcoming week, which included Halloween. It was time for Jess to pitch her idea to the group, but she remained silent, as most of her cliché ideas had already been taken by other anchors. I don't really have anything, she said in a defeated tone. The producers' faces clearly held disappointment, but they nodded in support. Well, that's okay. We have a couple of stories that you could go with, but they aren't exactly breaking news. Meet us after and we can break it down for you. Brian, the head producer, responded with an odd grin. Brian was about 15 years older and recently divorced. He had made attempts to hang out with Jess for some time now, way before his divorce. Jess smiled politely and the meeting continued. The meeting finally ended and rather than staying after to meet with Brian, Jess headed straight to the parking lot and jumped into her car. Instead of going home, Jess just waited and checked her emails on her phone in a last-ditch effort that any of her leads had replied back to her. After a few minutes of seeing no new emails, she started her car, but before she could put it in reverse, someone knocked on her window. To her surprise, it was Shane, her cameraman and good work friend. She smiled and rolled the window down. Shane was in his mid-twenties and covered in tattoos. His appearance caused many people to treat him differently, but not Jess. Shane was out there, to say the least. He was in some type of heavy metal band and was constantly talking about conspiracy theories, but was incredibly kind. Hey Jess, how'd the meeting go? Do you have a good story for us? Shane said optimistically. Jess's smile slightly faded as she shook her head. I got nothing that's big, and Brian's trying to meet up again. The two shared a long pause as both of their careers were on the line. Well, I guess that's good news because I think I might have something, Shane replied with a mischievous smile. Oh boy, well, what do you got? Jess replied, knowing fully well that it was going to be some conspiracy theory nonsense. Shane smiled and hopped in her passenger seat. Okay, hear me out on this, Shane started. Jess removed her glasses and rubbed her brow as Shane spouted off about how he met some girl at this party. Apparently, she was a part of some type of cult, who was trying to summon some entity called the Lord of Flesh. Jess put her glasses back on and gave Shane a look of disappointment. Alright, buddy. I think we should start drug testing you, Jess said sarcastically. But Shane insisted. No, seriously. I think we have a story here. I think since you don't have anything, this is worth looking into. Plus, I never ask for anything, and I'm asking you to check this out with me. I know where to go so we can both be concealed and we can have our story. Shane and Jess shared a brief moment of seriousness that they rarely had. Jess paused. It's either this or meet with Brian. Okay, fine, Jess said. The two then got prepped for the story and planned on meeting back at the news station around 7. Jess arrived and Shane was already waiting for her in the parking lot. His studio van door was open and he was having a cigarette. Jess pulled into the spot next to him and got out to greet him. Shane put away his cigarette and hopped in the driver's seat and Jess hopped in the news station van. The two took off of the parking lot and onto the highway. Jess was worried, not for what they were about to investigate, but about her career. If this story flops, then she knew that Brian would have an issue for not having a story for Halloween. Shane was visibly excited to be checking out this story firsthand. Normally, he had been restricted into basic surface level stories and nothing with real substance. But to be able to investigate a cult ritual in the middle of the woods for a Halloween story was a dream come true. Shane's GPS eventually led them off the well lit highway and down some back streets of less populated towns. The sun had set now and the streets were only illuminated by the yellow headlights of the station's van. Shane then parked the van off the side of a dirt road and exited the van. Here we are, he said excitedly. 
So the location is a good distance into the woods, but I made sure to give us enough time to hike there while I carry this heavy studio camera. Shane said while loading up the heavy camera and the external battery pack. The two set off into the dark woods with nothing but flashlights to guide them. I can't believe you talked me into this, Jess said out of frustration when the two were clear into the dark woods with nothing around them. Shane looked on his phone and pointed off into the distance. Oh please, not like you had anything better to report on. It's just over this hill, so we need to be quiet. The two did their best to walk up the steep hill with leaves on it, but sure enough, looking down on the other side of the hill was a cleared out area with a single torch lit. This is it, Shane whispered. Jess was slightly shocked to see that there was in fact some substance to what Shane was saying. We got here a little early. They should be coming soon. The two remained silent and fear began to crawl down their spines when they eventually saw off in the distance a small light coming towards them. Terror didn't even come close to describe what Jess saw. Amongst the many hooded figures were six people that had their hands tied behind their backs and were dressed in underwear with black sacks on their head. The sounds of sobbing and dread could be heard from those that were bound. Oh my gosh, Jess whispered to Shane. What is this? What are they gonna do to those people? Shane shared a similar reaction as he clearly had no idea what was about to happen. We need to call the police, Shane whispered. The group of hooded people arrived at the single torch and placed their torches in a circle which illuminated a small area which had some type of cylindrical structure in the middle, no higher than waist high. Is that a well? Jess asked. The two remained silent as the group all circled the well. The people that were bound continued crying as the sacks were removed and could see that they were out in the middle of the woods with no one to help them. Jess got up and whispered to Shane, I'm going to call the police. I want you to film what is about to happen so we have it as evidence. Jess got up and walked down the hill and towards where Shane parked the studio van and called the police. All the while, Shane stayed back and continued to watch what unfolded in front of him just down the hill. One of the hooded figures then took out a large leather book and opened it. The people in the hoods began to chant as the main figure continued to read. Shane was at a distance at which he should have been able to understand what was being said, but the words must have been foreign. As the main figure continued to read, the book then began to levitate slightly. Everyone in the hoods began to look anxiously. This has never happened before, one of the people exclaimed. Everyone, including the person reading the book, looked astonished. The people that were still bound began to cry harder, as they knew that things were about to get worse. The person reading the book looked shocked, but continued reading until the book hovered over the well and began to emit this black liquid from its pages. The book bled this liquid until it stopped and eventually fell into the well, causing everyone to be silent. Judging from the reactions of the cultists, this had never happened before. Shane stayed silent and filmed quietly as he watched what had happened next. A dark purple light emitted from the well, casting light and shadow all around the woods. The cultists fell down, including those that were bound and a figure began to come out of the well. Out of the well came a tall figure that looked similar to a human, but its features were greatly distorted. Its head had no hair, and it had holes from where its eyes once were, but had clearly been gouged some time ago. Its mouth was greatly exaggerated, as Hooks pulled what little flesh it had away from its teeth to show a huge mouth. Its body was naked, but had no genitals nor features to distinguish a gender. It looked like a demon from hell that had been suffering for a century, but also like an alien, as if it held some type of intelligence. The cultists looked on in terror as this figure fully levitated out of the well and displayed itself with white arms. It spoke with an unknown language, but all those that heard it were able to hear its voice in their minds speak English. I am the Lord of Flesh. You have released me from my exile on a plane of existence in which suffering is overflowing. Having freed me, I will grant unto you one wish for every soul you bring me. 
The cultists were too stunned to speak, and just stared at this monstrosity that stood before them. Finally, the one who spoke the words of the book finally stood and grabbed one of the bound people. Here is my sacrifice. I wish to serve you. The Lord of Flesh turned and faced the cultist, whose hood was no longer covering his face. Are you sure? Once you give me your sacrifice, there is no going back. The cultist paused and remained silent. After a small moment of uneasiness, he finally gave a nod. The Lord of Flesh then expanded his mouth wide and inserted the head of the screaming sacrifice into his mouth and crushed him with its teeth. The person only squirmed at first, but then went limp as the creature continued chewing until it was able to swallow its head. The Lord of Flesh then discarded the rest of the body and stretched out its hand to the cultist. As you wish, you will serve me as one of my followers. The cultist then fell down and began to shout in pain. The cultist's limbs began to grow and snap into strange shapes and angles as his head began to morph into that of a wolf-like creature. I have given you the power of the skinwalker so that you might serve me. The bound sacrifices screamed in horror as they saw what their fate would soon become. The Lord of Flesh then looked around the rest of the cult. Who wishes to serve me? Another cultist stepped forward, bringing along a weeping sacrifice, begging to be let free. The cultists removed their hood and bowed as the Lord of Flesh proceeded to widen its mouth again, and drew the terrified head into the gaping hole filled with teeth. The screams could still be heard from inside the mouth of the Lord of Flesh as it clenched down again. Brain spewed out of its mouth as it finally crushed the skull. The Lord of Flesh finished and discarded the body much like the other one. I will give unto you the ability to haunt those that you see. You now have the power of the rake. The cultist began to transform. His body began to pop and sizzle as his skin turned gray and his hands and feet began to grow large fingers that had talons coming out of them. His eyes began to go black, and his jaw snapped open as more razor-sharp teeth began to fill his mouth. Shane could tell that this man was immediately regretting his decision to follow the Lord of Flesh. The pain must have been excruciating, as Shane could hear his body clearly twist and tear into this new creature. All he could do was watch and film as this creature from another dimension continued to turn these people into these creatures. Jess was able to make it out of the woods and back to the studio van and called the police. She was dispatched to the local police station that was about 40 minutes away. She told them what was happening and gave them the location of where she was. We will be sending you police units now. We advise that you stay by your vehicle and away from the danger. Do not go back to the cult site. The police are on their way. Jess hung up her phone and debated on calling Shane. She knew that if she called them, that there was a chance that his phone would notify the cult and he would be their next victim. She had a decision to make. Does she stay safe by her vehicle or does she go back to save her friend Shane? An hour passes and the police arrive at the news station van, but no one is there. It's very late and the night is cold. Officers Fields and Redding exit their cruisers and report back that they found the van, but there was no sign of the woman that made the call. Another cruiser pulls up with Officers Garcia and Wallace, and they exit their vehicles. Do we have any sign of the woman? Garcia asked while putting on her police jacket. Fields was inspecting the vehicle, and Redding answered her. There's no sign of the woman, and the vehicle's engine is cold. The call said that there was people in the woods that were in danger, so the woman either went back and helped or something got her. Garcia shook her head. How hard is it for people to listen to instructions? Now we don't know where to go. Wallace walked over to Garcia and sighed. Well, what should we do? Wallace asked while glancing into the surrounding woods. Let's poke inside the woods and see if we can find anything. Call for backup and let them know that the woman is gone. Wallace nodded. 
You sure we should go into the woods without backup? Fields asked, clearly concerned. Fields, give me a break. Just because you're a rookie doesn't mean you get to chicken out all the time. Plus, I have a couple machine guns in the back of my cruiser if it makes you feel any better. Are those up for grabs? Officer Redding said while still inspecting the van with a flashlight. Only if you're going into the woods, Garcia responded. The three officers loaded up, and Wallace ended up staying back in order to help direct backup. All right, let's just check out the woods quickly and head back. We're not going to try to be heroes and end up getting lost and needing to be rescued ourselves. Got it? Also, if you see anything looking suspicious, try to use discretion, but don't get yourself killed. These cultists aren't to be played with, Garcia instructed as she picked up a shotgun with a flashlight undermount and started heading into the woods. Redding, Fields, and Garcia entered the woods fully armed. The woods were dark, but they were incredibly quiet. It wouldn't be easy to see anyone, but they should be able to hear anything. The three were quiet, trying their best to move forward while listening for any signs of the woman who might have made that call, or any of the cold members. It didn't take them long for them to find a light shining on the ground, a good ways away into the woods. The three police officers looked at each other and silently went to go investigate. On the ground on top of the leaves was a phone that was on the home screen. Redding bent down and picked it up. Redding checked the call history and sure enough, a 911 call was made over an hour ago. I think this was the woman's phone, Redding whispered while handing the phone to Garcia. What should we do? So we press on a bit more or head back? Garcia paused and thought. She looked back to the entrance of the woods and back of the phone. This woman is probably in trouble. Let's see if we can find her before something happens to her. Garcia pocketed the phone and led their way deeper into the woods. Fifteen minutes later, the three quietly searched the woods, as they then heard a bizarre sound that caused them all to stop. A howl erupted just ahead of them, causing them to stop. Garcia's hands began to sweat as she raised her shotgun's light in the direction of the sound. There shouldn't be any wolves here, she whispered. Something's not right, Fields whispered as he began to breathe more and more rapidly. Quick, turn off your lights, Garcia instructed while crouching down and aiming her weapon up ahead. The other two hesitated, seeing how they would be in complete darkness, but they followed orders. The three sat in silence and in complete darkness as they waited for their senses to adapt to the dark. Sure enough, a dull orange glow could be seen coming from the other side of the hill that was just in front of them. The three quietly walked towards the hill in darkness, hoping it would be enough to conceal them. They reached the bottom of the hill and found a large news camera still rolling and laying on the ground. What is this doing here? Fields asked quietly. Garcia inspected the equipment and realized that whatever was going on out here was probably captured on this camera. We need to get this camera back to Wallace and show backup, Fields. Why don't you take it back and tell him where to find us? Garcia commanded as she and Redding kept walking up the hill. Fields didn't hesitate and took off silently with the camera, making his way back through the dark woods. Garcia and Redding reached the top of the hill to see a small mound of headless bodies at the foot of the Lord of Flesh. They both gasped as they saw this hideous creature surrounded by all these different types of beasts. Some had twisted antlers and sharp teeth while others looked almost human, if they weren't eight feet tall and without faces. Others looked like aliens while one looked like a man with a goat's head. Each creature was different but equally terrifying in that they all looked predatory. In front of the Lord of Flesh was a woman who was missing an arm and a man on his knees. Don't do it, Shane, the woman missing the arm screamed as the man trembled before the hideous leader. You will either serve me or you will suffer beyond your imagination. The man was crying and shaking in pain as a wolf-like creature stood on two legs behind him and began to slowly clench its claw into his shoulder. Shane tried to hold off, but the pain was too much. Fine, I'll do it, just don't. A shot rang out from the hill. 
Redding shot the dogman clinching Shane, but to no effect. The Lord of Flesh looked on the hill and pointed, sending all types of monsters to get them. Redding and Garcia began firing at all the creatures, but none of them seemed to be affected. My servants have been given my power, and only I know how to kill them. Fields heard the gunfire and immediately started sprinting back to Wallace. The heavy camera was awkward since he was already carrying a machine gun. So he set the camera down and ejected the tape and continued sprinting. Wallace could hear the gunshots from the cruiser and radioed in for more backup. As Garcia and Redding were being torn limb from limb, the Lord of Flesh approached Shane, who laid on the ground crying. You are not worthy to serve me. You reek of fear, and your loyalty is amongst your own. The Lord of Flesh opened its mouth wide as he picked him up and bit his head off. Jess laid on the ground screaming, trying her best to not pass out from the blood loss. The backup arrived, but not in time. The seven or so police cruisers arrived to see Wallace and Fields waving them down, but something was off. Instead of having them park and help, Wallace and Fields ran to the first cruiser that they could and jumped in. We need to get out of here. There's something going on in these woods, and it's out of our control. Fields told the officer trying to park the cruiser. Trust us, we have everything on tape, we just need to leave now. The officer in the first cruiser was still talking to Wallace and Fields, when the other six sets of officers were exiting the vehicle. What did you boys see out there? The officer driving the cruiser asked. Before either of the officers could respond, a series of unmarked vans and blacked out SUVs pulled up. Soldiers dressed in hazmat suits and agents in suits began to pour out into the scene. Great. Who are these guys? One of the officers asked. A helicopter could be heard approaching the scene as the police chief exited his vehicle. Heavily armed vehicles parked blocking the police cruisers from the woods. Chief Davidson exited his cruiser and approached Wallace and Fields. What happened here? Before either of the officers could respond, the police chief was then approached by a man in a dark suit and a well-trimmed beard who was accompanied by two geared up soldiers. Good evening, gentlemen. I can assume you to be the one in charge, the man in the suit said calmly. Yes, I'm Chief Davidson. Who are you? The man in the suit then flashed a badge from under his coat. I'm afraid I can't tell you what part of the government I work for, but you may call me Director Borsky. I'll be taking over. I'll be needing all the information in regards to what has happened here. Chief Davidson was astounded and turned to both Wallace and Fields. Share with the director what you have. Fields tried handing the director the tape, but was immediately intercepted by one of the men carrying a large machine gun. Do not approach the director, yelled the soldier as he snatched the tape from him. Fields stepped back, astonished. Thank you for your cooperation, gentlemen. You all may go home, Borsky said while turning away. Wait, don't you want our help? Wallace shouted. The director stopped and turned to face him. As a matter of fact, I will be needing the officers who saw what had happened here to stay here for questioning. Everyone else will be gone in the next five minutes or I will be forced to remove you from my crime scene. Borsky turned and walked away while being handed the tape from the soldier. Wallace and Fields shared a concerned look with the chief as every police officer eventually left the scene. A woman in a business suit holding an iPad approached the two remaining officers. Officers. Will you please follow me to my vehicle for questioning? Oh, and I'll also be needing your weapons. Fields and Wallace were worried. We're state appointed policemen of the state of Idaho. We are required to be armed while on duty. The woman smiled. Of course, and we're very grateful. However, we're about to take you to our facility which does not allow unauthorized weapons. The two soldiers that were standing next to the woman raised their guns slightly, indicating that this was an order and not a request. Wallace handed over his pistol and Fields gave his machine gun and pistol to both soldiers, who took them and they all followed the woman. Borsky took the tape and handed it to another man. Tell me what's on the tape within the hour. I want to know what we're dealing with. Also, get me in contact with Detective Slater. I'll be needing his expertise and 
that friend of his, Mr. White, before sunrise. Two hours passed and there was a knock on Detective Slater's door. It was around four in the morning, but he was still awake. Slater grabbed his pistol and peered out the door to see a woman in the suit, with a handful of soldiers behind her. Slater was genuinely confused. Who is it? He yelled. It's the United States government. There has been a situation and we need you to come in. Slater paused. Why do they need me? He thought. We're not actually here for you. We're here for Mr. White. Slater was stunned. We are not here to arrest you. There's been an incident and we think there's something much worse than just one Wendigo. Slater opened the door and agreed. I knew you would understand, the woman said smiling. A soldier then placed a sack on his head and guided him to one of the SUVs and they took off into the night. After an hour, the sack was removed and Slater was sitting in a dark room with the TV and the woman. The two then watched the entirety of the film of what happened in the woods, with the Lord of Flesh turning all of his followers into various cryptids. Slater was stunned. What do you want me to do? Have Mr. White kill them all? No, I'm afraid it's not that simple. We need to figure out how to kill each one and this Lord of Flesh before it turns the rest of the world into these monsters. We have been told that you know more than your fair share about these things, and you know how to stop them. Slater was silent, but also relieved. If you help us with this, then we'll leave you and your friend alone. But if you decline, it'll be the last thing you do, the woman said plainly. It would appear that I don't have much of a choice. The first creature is a skinwalker. Those can be killed by an ash bullet, or if you know the name of the person, then you can kill them by saying it to them. The next is a wendigo. Those can be killed by fire or damaging their brains. The dogmen don't like silver, so I think that's how they die. But as for the Goatman and the Rag and Slenderman, I don't know if those can be killed. Slater and the woman were silent. At that moment, Director Borsky entered the room with a small gray alien and sat down. Here's the deal, Borsky said while leaning forward. I will give you any resource you need including my friend here, in order to kill these followers. But I want you to bring me this Lord of Flesh, alive. Slater shook his head, as he had seen this type of alien before. The last time I saw one of those, it tried to kill me. Borsky smiled wide. We know. However, my friend Bob here is a part of the department, and he will be vital to this operation. He won't harm you. Bob waved to lighten the mood. Bob here can shapeshift and to a degree, able to use telekinesis and telepathy. This should make the playing field somewhat even. Slater exhaled and shook his head. How am I supposed to capture this flesh guy without him killing us? Slater said frustrated. The director got up and walked over to the door. I'm sure you'll figure it out, Borsky muttered as he exited the room. Bob and Slater shared a brief moment where the two just looked at each other. I don't have to look like this, Slater heard in his mind, but the voice wasn't his. In fact, I can look like you. Bob then transformed into a similar looking man around the same age as Slater. Just try not to get in the way, Bob. Slater took the two officers, Wallace and Fields, and were given a small team for him to lead, as well as his new teammate, Bob. The team included eight soldiers, a handful of military-grade vehicles, and an infinite amount of weaponry and ammunition. Out of the weapons, Slater only took with him several machine guns and a couple of high-powered sniper rifles and three flamethrowers. The rest would be useless, and even the ones he picked out would need alterations to make them fatal to the creatures. Slater and Bob gathered the team and briefed them on what they were about to do. Good evening, team, or should I say good morning at this point? I'm Detective Slater, and this is my new partner, Bob. We will be hunting several entities and cryptids that have powers and abilities that we will need to assess before we engage them. The first cryptid that we will be pursuing is the Dogman. We need to be extra cautious, seeing how only silver objects can harm it, and this creature is incredibly fast and strong. Bob then began handing out boxes of silver bullets, as Slater continued talking. The goal here is to pick off these cryptids one at a time. 
Altogether, they'll be nearly impossible to stop. It is vital that we stop this flesh guy before he and his followers hit a major city and cause real problems. The team started loading their weapons with silver bullets, as Slater continued. There has been a sighting on the way to this small town about 30 minutes ago, and we need to check it out. Any questions? The soldiers looked unfazed by the news, but Wallace and Fields were stunned. Fields raised his hand. What if we don't want to do this? He asked, cowardly. This is a top secret mission. You will be held in detainment until we eradicate all these entities, Slater said coldly. Trust me, buddy, you are not backing out of this, one of the soldiers whispered. The team loaded up in several vehicles with all the equipment. It was six in the morning, but the sun showed no sign of rising. They all drove in unison to a small town, hoping to stop the reign of terror before it began. To their horror, the small town of 8,000 people appeared to be abandoned. Most doors were dark, but the ones that weren't didn't have anyone inside. The team parked at the first building and all got in formation. Slater and Fields led one team while Wallace and Bob led the other. We're taking the left side of the street and you guys take the right. Notify the other team before engaging. Slater and Fields began their sweep of the town which was incredibly eerie. The buildings were pretty old but still usable. Do you think they're even here? Fields asked out of concern. I'm not sure whispered Slater, as he focused on the task. Halfway through the search, Wallace and Bob radioed over. Slater, we got signs of a cryptid here. We are at the hospital across town, and there's blood everywhere in the lobby. We will wait for you before you proceed. Slater and Fields double-timed the team over to the hospital and met up with Wallace and Bob. Wallace was looking at his watch and was concerned. It's 8.30. Where's the sun? Wallace asked. It was still pitch dark outside. It would appear that the earth had stopped rotating, Bob said. The sooner we find this guy, the better. Bob, notify the director that we need backup on this location, Slater said. Okay, let's sweep this building. There's a good chance that there might be something here. The two teams converged into one, and Slater led the way. Inside the hospital, the lobby was absolutely destroyed. There was a strong indication of a struggle with something large. The team searched the main floor with no signs of people aside from the vast amounts of blood. I don't get it, Slater. Where are the bodies from all this blood? Fields asked. Without looking, Slater responded. They aren't trying to kill everyone. They're trying to convert them. The team followed the blood that led to a set of stairs leading down into a dark basement. Bob told Slater telepathically that there were several unknown life forms down below. Slater motioned with his hand, notifying his team to get ready as they descended the stairs. The basement stairs were covered in blood, and the lights on the stairs stopped working the further they went down. Slater signaled for a flamethrower to be brought to the front as they reached the bottom. The soldier manning the flamethrower ignited the weapon. They turned the corner to see an empty hall, but screams could be heard from deep within. Not just a few, but many. We have to stop them before they get more, Wallace whispered. Slater nodded. The team pressed silently down the hallway and turned the corner. Slater's light shined, revealing 30 or so people facing the wall, and the number of cryptids had tripled since the last interaction. The Lord of Flesh had converted more beasts to his foul army. Standing behind the people were many types of monsters, but the Lord of Flesh was not there. Take them out! Slater screamed as a flurry of bullets ripped from the many guns pointed down the hallway. The beasts were caught off guard as several of them fell from the silver bullets. Several dogmen began to howl with pain as the silver ripped them apart, but the other cryptids seemed to not take any damage. Some of the dogmen tried to attack, but were quickly mowed down. However, several other cryptids began to press the team. Slater called up the flamethrower and unleashed a devilish flame that illuminated the entire hallway of the basement. The flames ignited several beings and the rest of the humans that did not convert. The screams were horrendous. However, there were still some cryptids that were not affected from the silver nor the flames. 
A rake creature jumped on the flamethrower and began slashing at his stomach. Several more began to crawl towards them, and the team started to pull back. Fields tried to shoot the rake off the soldier, but to no effect. One of his bullets hit the gas tank, causing the tank to let out a loud hiss, releasing all the gas. Everyone upstairs, Slater screamed. The hiss from the tank almost immediately touched the front nozzle holding the flame, and a small explosion erupted. Bob stepped forward, turning back into his original form and projected a purple force field, separating the explosion from the team. The blast knocked back many creatures, but they were getting up almost immediately. The team ran up the stairs and the sound of a distant helicopter could be heard in the distance. Slater, we need to get to the roof where the helicopter pad is. They can pick us up from there, Bob said telepathically to Slater. We need to get to the roof, Slater screamed as the creatures started to ascend from the basement. At this point, their weapons were useless. All the cryptids that remained were no longer affected by the bullets nor the flame. Despite their initial attack, there were still many cryptids very much alive. Slater was then jumped by one of the creatures and screamed out of pain. Bob's turned to help, but it was too late. Slater was already swarmed by the beasts. Bob led the team up the stairs and through the hospital to reach the roof. Slater was being cut from all sides of his body when he began to transform into Mr. White. Mr. White's Wendigo form caused the beast to stop attacking him, since he was now one of them, but Slater was still in control of his mind. Mr. White, we need to hold these guys off until our team is able to get out of here. Mr. White then got up and began to crush the smaller cryptids with his large talon-filled claws. The cryptids then turned on him again, but to no avail. Mr. White's Wendigo form was too powerful for two or even three monsters at once, but there were still dozens and dozens coming out of the basement. Seeing that the monsters were no longer going for his team, Mr. White then fled from the stairs, seeing how if he kept this up that he would soon die, even in his Wendigo form. Two choppers landed on the roof and picked up the team, taking them back to safety. Mr. White was left at the hospital and took refuge in the nearby woods. This was going to be much more difficult than he thought. The cryptids alone almost killed Slater and his team, had it not been for Bob and Mr. White. Slater needed more help, and he knew exactly who to go to. Slater was able to radio to Bob that he was still alive and to pick him up. It was 10 a.m. now and the sun still hadn't rose. The earth was just as dark as it was when the Lord of Flesh appeared. A chopper was sent to pick up Slater, but inside to greet him was Bob, Fields, Wallace, and Borsky. Bob was flying the chopper, and Borsky jumped out to greet him. So, you took out a handful, but nowhere near all of them. The Lord of Flesh wasn't even there, and he beat you. What are we gonna do? Borsky said frustrated. Slater hung his head. I know of one more person that might be able to help us, but she's unreliable. There's a witch in the woods, and she knows how to kill any cryptid. Last time I talked to her, she got my client killed. We are out of options. If we don't get this earth spinning soon, then we're all going to die, Borsky said while getting in the chopper. Let's go find her. Slater jumped into the chopper, and Bob read his mind, telling him where the witch was. Bob flew the chopper two hours north to an eerie set of woods where the cave to the witch was. They landed in a small clearing not far away, and Slater led the way. Bob stayed in his alien form and Borsky and the other officers followed while holding rifles. Slater was able to find the cave again, but there was something wrong when they approached the opening. Outside the cave were hundreds of people in a zombie-like state. Amongst the people were various cryptids and even aliens that looked monstrous. What is this? Slater whispered. The group stopped, seeing that there was something off about where this witch was staying. She is in there with him, Bob said telepathically to Slater. He can't use his powers in there. The witch put a curse on that cave and no one has power in there but her, Slater whispered to the group. Now is the time to kill him. But how do we get past the army of followers? Fields whined from the back. I have a theory, but it's risky, Wallace said, as he placed his weapon down and walked towards the followers. You said his powers won't work, right, while he's in the cave? So his followers shouldn't attack us. The group was silent. That's risky, but it's worth a shot, Borsky said while laying down his gun. 
Bob and Mr. White should be able to protect us if this goes south, right? Wallace approached the cave and sure enough, the followers were unresponsive. The rest of the group saw this and followed behind and entered the cave with Wallace. Once inside, the group made their way through the cursed cave, feeling dread and fear deepen with each step. Once inside, the Lord of Flesh and the Witch turned to see the group enter the small cave. Slater, what a lovely surprise, the witch said with black teeth. I'm sure you met my new best friend. His work is amazing, she hissed with an evil smile. I'm here to bargain with you. This Lord of Flesh will destroy this planet if we don't stop him. A planet that you live on, Slater said. I am granting her royalty on my own planet, the Lord of Flesh said while smiling. She will have an infinite amount of souls to torment if she follows me. The Lord of Flesh walked over to Borsky. Do you remember me? To me it felt like eons, but for you, it was only a couple of years. Borsky looked shocked. I've seen a lot of things in my time, but I haven't had the misfortune of meeting you. Of course you know me. We used to work together to kill those things like him. The Lord of Flesh said while pointing to Slater. Borsky paused. The only person I killed the Winnego with was... The Lord of Flesh smiled. That's right. I used to go by the name of Agent Johnson, but that was before. I have now ascended beyond and have shown many a great and terrible things. Things I want to show you. How is this possible? Borsky gasped. The portal I use doesn't just travel through time, but also space. I used the portal to save that one family from turning into Wendigos, but I decided not to stop there. Why not use it to travel through space? I have traveled to many places, most of which were inhospitable, but I eventually found a new planet filled with pain and horror. It turned me into this, and I now wield unrivaled power. I'll make a deal with you. You guys give me Borsky and I'll go back to where I came from, but my followers stay behind. What do you think? The Lord of Flesh said while smiling wide. Borsky was shocked. I'm not going anywhere with you, he said while pulling out a pistol. Slater and Bob immediately jumped the director and wrestled the gun from his hand. Take him and leave, Slater said. Only one small problem. This witch won't cast me a portal unless I offer her something she wants. She wants the spirit of a Wendigo, but I can only transform her permanently. She wants to be able to turn at her own will. We all know how this ends for you, Slater. She must eat you. Much how you ate your father to become who you are today, the Lord of Flesh said. Slater paused. No, there must be another way. Wallace said. No. I promised this witch a while ago that she could eat me once I died. Today seems as good as any, Slater said with a slight hint of sadness. The witch jumped up and down and started dancing, and she made her way over to Slater. Don't worry, dear. I'll be sure to kill you first, she said with a smile. She slashed his throat with her sharp fingernails and began twisting his head off. With a quick snap and tear, she pulled his head off and his neck and head still bled. Oh, how I wanted this for some time now, she said while holding her prized trophy. She then casted a portal on the far wall. The blue hole in space twirled as the Lord of Flesh grabbed the struggling Borsky by the throat and walked over to the portal. This isn't the last you'll be seeing me, Borsky screamed as he and the Lord of Flesh walked through. The portal closed, and Bob, Wallace, and Fields were left inside the cave, as the witch began feasting on Slater's body. Did we win? Is it over? Fields said, confused. We still have his followers to deal with, Bob said, as he and Wallace turned to leave the cave. The three left the cave to see that all the followers had left, and had scattered into the nearby woods. The sun began to rise in the distance, as the three walked through the woods, back to the helicopter.